Well, hello and welcome to episode 46 of uh, practicalshowtech.com. Who would have thought we would have been on 46 by now? Um, it's crazy. Uh, we're having such a great time. I know you're not supposed to smile and be happy during these uh, these challenging times, but I'm trying to find uh, uh, that uh, silver lining. And, and frankly, um, disproportionately, I will say, I've been able to find a lot of really cool silver linings, like 46 of them. And uh, this has been uh, a, a great and um, uh, adventure that's still going. Uh, one of the things that's really unique, we were all talking about this prior to the webinar beginning, and that is that really in no time in history have we had a chance to connect such a broad group of audience uh, with a manufacturer. Um, the end user, the dealer, the um, uh, the technician who's using it, um, all of these people, and and we've always had this very fragmented uh, communication um, uh, that that has to be, and I I understand that you know we've got dealer communications, we got end user communications, we now have COVID nineteen communications. I mean, we got a lot of communications. Thank goodness we are in the communication business, and. Uh, uh, today's topic is is pretty specific, uh, and that was intentional uh, for a couple of reasons. One is we can. Um, uh, we're not constrained to, oh my goodness, uh, everybody's going to be at work tomorrow, and if we don't cover everything in this webinar, they'll never listen again. Um, we, we are in that unique position of people want to listen, and, and as more details come in. So today, is really focused around the software of Crewware and um, the discussion around Microcom, right? And something we didn't really get to when we did the high overview, uh, we get a lot of critiques about, man, you guys are too advanced, you guys aren't advanced enough, or, you know, I just wanna know the basics. Well, that's the cool thing. We're gonna come at this one from all directions. Today is all about software and all about understanding kind of the, the full um, breadth of, client technologies and and where we can apply that out in the field so um mac and pete good to see you again today um, good to be seen. i am going to let you guys kind of talk through um q a because i think um as always when software is relay you know is is involved and we're doing step by steps uh there'll be um uh, a fair amount of uh of questions um, or, um, you know, Pete's always so good at finding, um, finding, what do, we, what do we call those Easter eggs? Um, yeah. uh, I'm going to call them that in, uh, everything. So without further ado, I call it breaking man. eggs. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, I'll leave it to you and, uh, you and, uh, Mac, uh, to kind of get us going here and then, uh, I'm going to be following along. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm, uh. I'm really interested in hearing this because although we have heard about Crewcom in previous sessions, um, we're dealing with a lot, not just not just crew compliant and Crewcom, but with pretty much all the manufacturers we've talked to, we're talking about pretty complex systems. And it, it really, uh, I need to see it more than once. I, and it, the fact that we're able to do this is, is uh, I think, fantastic. and uh, I'm hoping to uh, absorb more this time than I, you know, try to try to get complete learning uh, through this through this process. We will do uh, as usual. Uh, we'll do our Q and A uh, for those of you who've been here before, and I'm pretty certain that's most of you. You know, you know the drill. But for those of you who haven't, there is a uh, questions and answers uh, pull down in the Go to webinar panel on the side of your screen. Open the uh, questions, and there'll be a um, a field where you can type in your questions. We will try to get to every question. Uh, we might not get to all of them, but we'll try to get to every topic if we can't get to every individual question. Also, be sure you're very specific in your questions because they're probably not going to get addressed right at that moment. And if they don't refer, you know, if they don't specify what they're referring to, it's very hard to parse what the question is about. Because, uh, you know, it may be 
a few minutes, it might be 20 minutes after you type the question when when we get to addressing it and uh, we need the reference to get back. And the same thing with comments. You know, if you have a comment that says that's great, say what's great, because that's great. We don't know what we don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, that's about it for QA and how to do it. Um, Pete, you want to explain what we're doing here? Well, in in the prior shows, they've been pretty straightforward crewcom uh, uh, features and uh, equipment and uh, programming. But but we had a lot of questions about uh, frequency. How do you use this when other devices in the same frequency band are operating? What effect does that other equipment have on crewcom? What does effect does crewcom have on them? Um, and that's one of the topics we're going to be covering today. If you have specific uh, uh, questions about uh, the, the equipment that you know of that op operates in uh, what is it X53? I think is that am I right on that? X52 in the U.S. X52. Um, uh, bring it up and we'll talk about that. Uh, Gary is going to be doing a little bit of talking about about uh, the product itself uh, and 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 that question. Uh, he's going to do a little tiny bit of crewware demonstration of where things are in crewware, and then we're going to go to Art. Art is going to do a detailed programming session on crewware, and finally we'll go to Mark and talk about Microcom, which is uh, a, a fascinating, inexpensive intercom system that is all uh, uh, all all wireless. I think I don't think it interfaces the outside world, right? It will actually. We have a box in development that will allow you to integrate it to a four wire connection. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, go ahead, Gary. You take it away. Okay. Um, let's see if I've got my slideshow running. I did have a little computer issue. You're Is right it... in it. You're in the show right now. We see it. Okay, great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, as uh, Pete said, we've got uh, Mark and Art each taking a, a portion of our presentation today. Uh, we're going to try to talk about a lot of things, um, you know, the philosophy of our system, the architecture. Uh, Art's going to talk a little bit about our latest software release, which came out Monday, 1.8, a uh, bunch of enhancements. It's going to get into some in-depth uh, crewware application operation. And, uh, and as Kelly said, you know, please ask specific questions. We'll do our best to answer them. And Mark will get into our microcom series and the smart boom headsets. And uh, the the uh, micro boom is uh, a microcom is uh, actually a pretty uh, uh, revolutionary product. And it. it's small, it's light, it's inexpensive, but it's actually good quality. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do, uh, some of you may have uh, Gary. I'm I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to. Mention, I know we're going to be, we have, I believe there's a link somewhere for people to download the software. Um, I just want to make sure they mention that now. So in case people haven't downloaded it, they could go there and go ahead and download it um, so that when I get to the portion with Crewware, they'll be ready to go and kind of play along. Right. Additionally, and, additionally, the this this slide presentation right now is in the handout section. So if you want to get this slide presentation, you can do that. All right. And if for some reason you don't have the link, you can go directly to applyingtechnologies.com and under downloads, you'll see crewware. It is free and you'll be able to do just about everything with the exception of Bell Packs, which of course you wouldn't have available to you. Um, but Art will take you through that. So I wanna do a fast review of uh, what we talked about a couple of weeks ago um, when we talked about the system in depth, just for those who may have missed it, just as a baseline refresher. Um, so uh, let's see here. There we go. Okay, so everybody's got a good view of the bell pack that's running, I hope. Yeah, we got it. Okay. All right. So, you know, we've got a, a, one of the mandates from, from the company is if it's not easy, don't do it. Make it simple for the customers. Yes, it's wonderful. You know, there, there's only a handful of us that manufacture wireless intercom. And they're all very different than one another, other than you can talk and listen on them. And how they get there is very different. And so each of the systems has specific benefits, but our focus has been a very usable, easy system. Something that can set up and go, but also has depth to it when you need 
full on application and we're going to go into that. Um, so we are a network based system and that allows us to decentralize what we're doing. We can put resources where we need them and it is a uh, proprietary network. It does not use IP. Uh, it does need our switches for a number of reasons. Uh, but the IPR, but the architecture lays out similar to IP. So you use our hardware, but it does use Cat5 cable and it does use fiber. And so laying out a network is fairly familiar. One of the things is that our network doesn't care about frequency, and we do have multiple frequencies available. We're going to talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, and so the system itself is really distributed. As we build up with more transceivers, as we build up with more control units, uh, it really doesn't matter who's where, it becomes one very large system. Um, so it's unusual in that we don't use a matrix style core, but the system does operate as if it did, because when you add resources, it becomes a resource to the whole unit. It's not like multiple units just interconnected. Um, Okay, so just quickly, um, starting the top left, those are our little adapters, four to four and four to five. If you've got a five pin headset and you need to go into a four pin anything, a uh, great little device. Um, our hubs, which look very familiar. Uh, the transceiver, which is kind of the heart of RF. Uh, the control unit, which creates our network and our headsets and chargers. So <clears throat> control unit has traditional two wire, uh, basically every flavor. It has four wire. We have a two and four IO version of these. Uh, all the connections are available live. And we've got things like stage announce and, and multiple networks and sync. So we'll go into that, but the interface is fairly familiar. There's nothing on here that's, that's uh, unfamiliar to everybody. So the transceivers, there are two separate models. Uh, and one for 2.4 and one for 900. Uh, they are uh, both operate the same way and the system doesn't care as long as you tell it there's gonna be a 2.4 plugged in here or tell it's a 900, uh, any 2.4 or 900 can be plugged in. So it's very agile that way. One of the unique features is that the antennas are actually removable. And so one of the things we're gonna talk about today is the RF side as somebody responsible for RF when you get to the show. This is great, it's simple, it's easy, and it just works. But what happens when it doesn't? What do you do? What are the tools available? So, and one of the best tools we've got available, and, and Pete has uh, uh, actually uh, witnessed this himself, the ability to take off these antennas in a crisis and put on a different type of antenna uh, worked out very well for him. So the transceivers themselves are um, relatively small. They come with a microphone stand mount and you can come in either fiber or copper. You can daisy chain through them. You can locally power them. So they're fairly versatile. Um, the removable antennas is a, is a big deal. And uh, the hubs, excuse me one second. I actually have my dog in my room who's trying to get out. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> I love that about in today's webinars. We have our dogs, we have our kids, we have our family. It's great. Yeah, I actually, uh, I have a, uh, our gardener is here today and I had to tell him to please don't use the air blower next to the window in my office while we, this was going on. So it's, it is a real time in real life. Okay, so the copper hub, we have two hubs, copper and fiber. They're both a port and the copper hub has one fiber port and the fiber hub has one copper port and these guys can be put in series of one another you can go four layers deep so almost any kind of deployment that you want to have copper fiber both in many areas very simple to do uh, the system itself really from a basic system consists of only a control unit one transceiver over fiber or copper and your choice of 900 or 2.4. Uh, 900 is really North America and part of the band for Australia. 
2.4 can be used any place. And the radio packs themselves, we're going to use up to six per transceiver. And in order to build the system, we can just add a second transceiver and a third transceiver. So a single control unit can use up to 18 radio packs. And then we multiply that by additional transceivers. So we can build up four transceiver, uh, four control units with multiple transceivers and give you 72 users in at any location. That can be done um, either 2.4, 900, or a mix of both. So it's a fairly simple system to start out as a small throwdown for four to six users or go big. Okay. Um, okay. I got a message that the sharing was off. Is it back on now? No, it's on. Okay, it's thank on. you. Okay. Never was off. All right. So um, once we start out, we go back to a smaller system, just a basic throwdown, but we need more coverage. So for that, we can do fiber or uh, go directly into a hub or copper, and we can put additional transceivers, and we have very good quality seamless roaming between the locations, a bit like a cell phone. We just go from one area to another. Unlike a cell phone, where if you lose connection, you don't have to redial, it will come in. And it comes in right at the edge of coverage. There are some systems that have some roaming capability, but they really want to get far back into the coverage area before they pick up. Um, and of course, we can daisy chain into a dressing room, um, and we can put a second control unit in a different location. And so we could have a one control unit on the stage and that could be going from some IO to Video Central and we could have one out in the truck and connect them via fiber or copper and they become one big system. So the IO gets distributed in locations. And so we can roam between all of those. And that is even though we've got two control, two control units in two locations, hubs, we've got transceivers all over the place, it's really one big system. So while there are other systems that have a quote standalone version, those standalones are almost uniquely a single kind of base station that allows you to use a few packs. And as soon as you need more than that, you then need to go to a, a big matrix frame. We allow you to build up and down the system very quickly. So if you had a rental house today, you could do a job with 60 users, no problem, and tomorrow it's three different jobs, and, and you utilize your gear that way. So that's an overview of the hardware, the review. Let's talk about what happens when we get to the show. Um, we've had a, more than a few instances where people have gotten too comfortable because we do almost always just work. Most of the time, you come in, and you set it up and you're done. If you put the antennas up, you're done. But it isn't all the time. This is RF, we never know what we're coming into and things can happen. Over the years, the biggest thing that the RF guys have said to me is, okay, your system's great and it's automatic and it does this, but if something doesn't work, what do I do? And what's what I wanna talk about today is what do we do? So. Um, the transceivers first. So they are physically identical except for the labeling and the frequency that they're in. And a single system may have a maximum of, and this is whether it's one or four transceivers, up to 16 different 2.4 transceivers and also 14 900 meg transceivers. So we can put both frequencies on at the same time. Regardless of frequency, our belt pack count stays the same. So if I put on all 2.4 or all 900 on four control units, we have 72 users. But if I mix the frequency, we still have a max of 72 users. We have the ability to go beyond there by synchronizing multiple systems, but for now, let's concentrate on what we have here. So extending coverage, increasing the number of users, density, uh, et cetera. And our ability to control this, 
is very straightforward. One of the things that happens in some of the systems is that you can't necessarily control what individual is allowed to go where. You don't have user rights by transceiver, by antenna. And that could be a big problem. The example is uh, we have a green room and we have a stage and we have operators and we have cameramen and lighting men. And in the green room, we need access all the time to the producer, the A1, the director, the LD. There's a half a dozen people we need to make sure we want. But we take a break and we've got a half a dozen cameramen and we've got the three lighting guys and they happen to be outside that break room and they steal all of the available resources. Well, we have the ability to administer user rights by area. So Art will take you through how that's done but I could basically say that the spotlight guys can go any place in the theater, but when they get near the green room, the break room, they do not log in. They don't steal that resource. The only people who can get in there are the producer, the director, the stage manager, the people that we want on. So you don't really have to overcover to try to uh, compensate for people who might actually take your resources. You can specify not only who talks to who, but where they're allowed to go. Okay. Hey, Pete, your camera's still on. I don't know if you know. <laughs> okay. And Art will talk a little bit more about that. Um, so, and that's called the scan list. Um, the next thing is quick overview on the technology. So we have two bands. Both of these bands, the, both of the radios are very similar in the way that they operate. They both frequency hop, and that is different than a lot of the other systems out there. Most of them are not frequency hoppers. They might change frequencies occasionally, like the deck systems. You might have some frequency agility, like the more, the, the more analog style systems. Uh, we hop in a very unusual way for most comm systems, in that we change frequencies on a given system about 100 times a second, every 10 milliseconds. And we do that for 2.4 and for 900. And we'll talk a little bit about more about the banding, but basically um, you've got 26 megahertz of space. In 900, we're at 902 to 928. And at 2.4, we're 2.4 to 2.48. So depending on how much uh, bandwidth we've got available, will limit how many transceivers we can have. So there are discrete hopping points that we go to within those frequency bands. In 900, I believe there's 18 specific frequencies that we use over and over again. And I believe it's 38 in the 2.4 band. So we're gonna, we're gonna go back and uh, talk a little bit about that in implementation. But basically, uh, every one of these gets transmitted out of a frequency, out of an antenna. And you see on the right-hand side, that's the data packet one. And then 10 milliseconds later, we're gonna transmit the same data. On the left-hand side, you see we're frequency number two and the same data. The third transmission will be a new data packet off again a new frequency. And the fourth transmission, again, 10 milliseconds later, will be a fourth frequency, same data. So it's not a diversity system, it's a redundant system. All packets get transmitted two times, okay? Um, and this allows us to have a lot of systems working in the same place. We all reuse the patterns, but they have algorithms. So you and I never are on the same transmission frequency at the same time. But you may be on, on the next hop, you may use what I'm on now. And it's really quite an interesting system, but mathematically allows us to get very good data recovery. And so this is really kind of what it looks like. And if you have interference in one area, you're not likely to see it in the next area. Uh, I'm gonna skip over the Wi-Fi portion for a second. Um, and just show you a little bit about the multipath. So that's quite a, a formula there. But multipath is a problem everywhere. 
Um, and multipath is a it's a problem in the, in acoustics too. In phasing, you get a comb filter. Well, here this is pretty much a square wave, and it bounces back and really becomes destructive. So if we had a truly directional antenna, what would happen is it would go right from one signal to another, one antenna to another. Not the way it works. We get reflected paths, and so this reflection creates a shadow, and then if that shadow is a uh, reflection is 15 to 20% delayed in time, it really messes our ability to, uh, to recover the data. And we've done a very unique system where we do a uh, three times wider bit and everything else being equal, the delay is the same. So now it's reduced by two thirds or to about five to six uh, percent. And so we've got some good, good systems in here. Um, and that's how the system operates. But let's talk a little bit about what you can do if you're not getting the results that you want. So um, the RF system configuration and control is done by the software. And I am going to go over to our crewware. Do we have crewware on the screen now, guys? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so what I've done is I've done a configuration. I'm offline here, and I've done a configuration, and you can download the software and do it yourself. And I've done a, just a thrown together configuration one control unit, a hub with a 2.4 and a 900 and a fiber hub and a 2.4 and a 900. And this is just to show you that anything can get plugged any place. It doesn't, it's not restricted. But the actual transceiver itself has a number of components about it that allow us to come in and make changes. So if I go to my list view, you will see the four transceivers and we can rename them. Um, so these are the 2.4 transceivers here. It tells you the model. Um, this is for a future expansion. This is just an internal ID. And the radio band itself, we have some frequency agility in both systems. They are slightly different. Now, for a normal system that you would set up, when you add a transceiver, it will automatically assign a hopping pattern for you. So you don't have to do anything other than uh, just go ahead, plug it in, uh, tell it what to do in the configuration and go to work. But we also have the ability to manually adjust a lot of this information. So I'm gonna go just to this transceiver and this is the individual transceiver view. This is where we can name things right and i can go this is number one and i can go back and forth this is a picture of it the serial number the firmware is unknown because there's nothing actually plugged in it tells me 2.4 and then the device id so i want to start with the 900 version uh, only because i know the majority of our audience is north america and i know that um, one of the things that's happened to us is people have had a wonderful experience with 900 with our system. And it's just turned on and worked. But I've also seen cases where people just assume that would continue and wound up having a problem and just didn't even check. And that was a problem, right? You, this is RF, guys, so you always have to test it. And I've seen cases where people just assumed it was going to be fine and ran into problems because of that. So let's talk about what is adjustable on here and what we can do and some new features that are really helpful. Now, if I were live, this would light up right underneath the slot radio pack, et cetera. This would light up to show us what packs were connected currently to this transceiver. This normal uh, button is for future expansion and the ID is just an internal ID for you. Um, we track the electronic serial numbers and other things uh, to know what transceiver you're on. So, under radio band, we said this is 902 to 928, and you can see this right here. But we also have the ability to change this and to go with a half band. So why would we want to do that? Well, let's say that you have 
uh, someone else who needs part of the 900 meg spectrum. And we had this recently at a big sporting event. It was actually for WWE. And uh, you may have been at a concert or been aware of seeing the new wristband LEDs that they like to pass out to the audience that pulse with the music and the show and becomes a you know part of the show for the audience. Well, this particular company had a system that ran in the 900 meg band. And they could also um, adjust their frequency. And they were a hopping system also. So what we did was we gave them the high frequency section, 915 to 928. And we then took for our system and put everybody on the low band of 902 to 915. Now, the good news is that there was no conflict. Everybody was fine because we were in different frequency areas, even though we were hopping. But by going to the low band, we actually get half or seven transceivers rather than 14 because we're cutting half of the band out. So we get at, at full band, we have 902 to 928, and, it, and that's 14 transceivers. If we go down the half band, we have seven. Now that was fine for what they needed that night, but we've come up with a better scheme. And what we've been able to do now is we've come up with a high, a low, or a mixed scenario. So I'll show you how that works. The hopping pattern, as I mentioned, gets automatically assigned but we can set them manually, right? And you do this, there's a couple of reasons why you'd wanna do this. If you had two adjacent studios working, you'd probably wanna manually assign your hopping patterns uh, so they work better together and you can synchronize them. Um, so the systems will synchronize, but they don't necessarily know what patterns the other system set to. So we can come in here and change this pattern to anyone we want. And, Quite honestly, the performance is the same in, in any way that you set them up. So if now we wanted to go to the mixed mode, mixed mode is very interesting because now you see we have the entire band, but we can set one through seven low and one through seven high for each transceiver. So what that means is in the same scenario, in the bowl where we needed our coverage of seven transceivers, we could use the first seven in low and still give the wristband people the high band. And then backstage or outside in the truck area or in the cars away from the wristband transmission, we can also use the high band and set up to seven more in the high band and the radio packs will still roam back and forth between them. So we can get pretty agile with the frequency, even with a hopping system, we can get around and get you a lot of frequency. Similar scenario is going to be looking at something like, is it the, um, Pete, the ULX, is it? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Same, same band, digital. Right, right. so the ULX is, um, is not a frequency hopper, but it is using 900 meg. So we really have the same issue there. How do we play along with them? Should we run into this? So we did a test to try it because there's nothing better than actually doing it. And what we set up was um, in, in a big rental house here, we brought in a, nine, a Shure 9 uh, system, ULX system and set it, we were at full band and we set it to, um, I believe 914 was what the Shure was set at. And we saw a couple of interesting effects. First, certainly if the Shure were, were within about 50 feet of our system, uh, we did not suffer any interference because we were hopping around so quickly, but the Shure was having some noise issues from us. If we got beyond the 50 foot range, it was really fine. It wasn't a problem, but you did still see us in their background, in their metering and their monitoring. But 
uh, audibly it wasn't a problem. So the next thing we did was we split the bands and we went to low band on Crewcom. And then we set the shore for 918. So we're 902 to 915, we set the shore to 918. And there we had no problems at all. The shore and the crew comp system worked just fine. So just like any other system that's RF based, you know, you've got the inverse square law, distance is everything from transmission. So can they all play together? Yes. What's the circumstances? How close are you? What other equipment's running in the area that potentially can affect it? Can you distance yourself? Can you band split? You know, all of these things work together. So um, we've got a way to, to split the bands. We've got a way to change the hopping patterns. We've also got a um, antenna attenuator. So we can reduce, and we'll do that sometimes. For example, NBC New York has about 350 packs in the building. And as the multiple systems are in the same area, but they're separate systems, we did reduce the transmission power on some of them because it quite frankly wasn't needed for the coverage and just helped us get a cleaner signal for independent systems. The next tool you've got available is the antennas. Now I explained that we do a dual transmission and we switch antennas. We can actually change the antenna configuration and when we do that, we still do a dual transmission. We do the two antennas for polarity, but if you're going into um, a distribution system, if you have to go with a Yagi antenna and you only have one, um, you have the ability to do a single antenna operation, the left one or the right one. You can even split the antennas for one transmit only, one receive only. So the dual antenna is the default mode, but we could just select one antenna um, if, you, if that's what you needed. Beyond there, if you selected one antenna as an example, and you only had a, uh, a relatively small, you know, uh, you've got a, a, a decent sized theater, you know, the 1200 seats, and you wanna get into another location that you're not transmitting into. It's still RF, and as long as you've got plenty of signal, you can't hurt anything by putting on a splitter and it puts a 3 dB pad on it, but you could put, especially 900, a piece of wire and another antenna and try splitting a sig second signal. So you've got the ability to carry multiple antenna types uh, Pete can tell you about a, a scenario that he had where everything was run on fiber until somebody crushed the fiber um, and they switched over to Yaggies. So that was huge. I don't, you know, with another system, you might not have been able to do the show. We can change the antenna configurations. We can change the, the frequency agility. We can change the transmit power. So there's a lot of tools in here for the RF guy to be able to deal with the scenario when the automatic doesn't happen. Hey Gary, what? just quick mention um, that when you do change anything having to do with frequency, like the band, um, that you, well, first of all, it affects all transceivers. In the case of 900, it will be all 900 transceivers. And also all your belt packs will have to be repaired. That's so correct. I just wanted to mention that. Right, as you make a significant radio change, uh, you do have to do a reconnection a pairing of the pack so they get that new information. And the whole system does want to be working together as one. You can't kind of split it up that uh, that way. You couldn't have, for example, some on low and, and some on high, you'd have to have mixed. Or you couldn't have some on low and some on full. The system does need to operate as one so the packs know how to, how to move the RF together. So that's the 2.4. Uh, the 900, rather. I want to move over to the 2.4 for a second. There were a couple of questions uh, sure. wanting a little more detail on that. Okay. Um, how is mix different than just setting the RTs in the bowl at low and the RTs by the truck at high? Okay, great question. Does the belt pack still not hop between the two RTs? 
So here, so here's this is brand new in version 1.8, and, and Art will talk a little bit more about that. But this was a this was exactly the scenario. So let's assume that we had a system, and the whole system had to be set to either low or high. You couldn't set some for low and some for high previously. And so if you needed to split the band, you only had a choice of low or high. You couldn't put them different. Uh, you couldn't have them both at the same time. But now we have the ability to have the mix is both at the same time. So if we used in the bowl all low to avoid hopping into the area where those lights were, and everything outside of the bowl was now set to high because they weren't interfering with the lights, you would roam from low to high automatically. So, uh, but just to, to expand on that, if you're in mixed mode and you were only using seven antennas and they were spread over your whole facility, backstage, whatever, you could set them all into B one through seven low or one through seven high, which in essence would be the same as just putting them all in low or all in high. Exactly, exactly. Now the only, from, from a, from a uh, technical difference, what happens there is rather than roam, rather than hopping over the um, 18 different, you're only hopping over nine. And so you will generally get better performance if you've got more band to hop across. But in most instances, you probably wouldn't hear any difference at all. And uh, so, along that same line, uh, Dan asked, what's the difference in quality between redundant, a parallel transmitting of the same packet and RXTX modes? Okay, so there's no quality difference whatsoever. It's just an antenna configuration. Um, so in the in the default mode, dual antenna, the first transmission goes out of antenna one, the second transmission goes out of antenna two, and the only difference is that you wind up with two different angles of polarity on the antennas. That's the only difference. If you go out of a single antenna, let's say the right antenna, we will still transmit two times, but you don't have the polarization differential. Quite honestly, I've done it both ways and in many, many scenarios, probably the majority of them, you might not notice any difference at all. But where this becomes very important is, Pete, let's say in your scenario where you lost your fiber octaves, uh, uh, optics, and now you've got only one Yagi to use. Well, it's very important that both signals see the same type of RF. You wouldn't you know, think of it like two frames of a field for video. You want both of those data packets recovered as much as possible so we can compare and use the best one, right? They're both required. So if you had two directional antennas, you wouldn't set them this way, right? You would set them this way or this way. You want both of those signals. So when we go to a single antenna, we are getting identical RF uh, back and forth, even though it's two times. So where we wind up with the biggest advantage of redundancy is over other RF interference because we're changing frequencies. So by going with a single antenna, um, it, can, it, it will give you the benefit of being able to use one antenna and not much downside. The diversity antenna, the dual antenna does help, but it isn't as dramatic as a dual set. Uh, John Christie asked again uh, regarding the different antennas. Could we set the ones in the truck to full, a whole band, and ones in the bowl to mixed low or just low so we get full frequency operation at the truck? No, unfortunately, the whole system has to be the same way. Um, and so you you would have it would be high or low in that scenario. Uh, I don't think you would actually uh, suffer much. I don't think you'd see much difference in it. Um, one of the things that we find is that 
with all of these systems, I've done a bunch of antenna experiments. And if you've got good RF coverage, very little of this changes the single or dual antenna, the, the half band frequency. If you've got good coverage, you're locked in. It's really at the fringe areas that these things tend to matter. Um, the other thing I want to mention is we've actually begun a program now with the 900 band. Uh, we have gotten a new antenna system that we've developed and we'll be implementing soon, which is giving us in the belt packs um, six to nine dB improvement. So we're working at putting those in and coming up with a retrofit program for existing users. But again, that helps you get more in the sweet spot. And if you have good coverage, um, one antenna or two, low band or high, um, you know, or full, none of that will affect much if you've got good RF. It's all about fringe coverage and where you have problem areas. In the in the situation I was in, I had a truck compound with five trucks, and I started out with three antennas in full mode uh, in the compound, but next to the trucks. It still wasn't good enough truck coverage for inside the truck. So I just took one of the antennas in a in the normal dual transmit mode uh, and put it inside the truck on a on a on a Sennheiser Omni 900 megahertz antenna and basically split it between inside and outside. And since we were so close to the transmitters all the time, it worked great. And the last two trucks, I split the antenna, one of the antennas passively into two different trailers uh, even though they were working in transceiver mode it worked fine right because you had plenty of rf signal and one of the real important pieces there is you just grabbed a sennheiser 900 antenna yeah right it's that they these are generic rf tools to work with and and the 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 yagis i actually was using between a between the truck compound and the studio, which was 600 feet, they wanted to have full coverage on all the belt packs and stage managers and technicians walking back and forth. So I just aimed a Yagi of, of, uh, of the two antennas from one transceiver towards the studio and the other end, I did it again. Both, uh, I don't remember whether I, I changed the polarity on them, but I think they just were facing the same way. Uh, John Christie asked, do you want 90 degrees of polarity with dual antennas? And it probably couldn't hurt. Well, uh, basically what you're looking at, we usually put them at about 45s. You're just looking for a slight bit of offset. But again, depending on where you are and the environment that you're in, if you're in a, in a convention hall and there's very little reflection going on, it almost doesn't make much of a difference. In general, we'll put them up at about, at a, at about 45s like this well that uh, makes them, what, that basically I, makes them 90. um yeah well right right, right. and that's right. for on these but it, again if you're going to put over we've got corner mounts we've got c circular polarity uh you know yagis depending on the type of antenna um i think with yagis you really wouldn't if you're going to put up two yagis i wouldn't do 90 degrees at all i try to aim them both at the same area well um, 90 degrees rotation not did not direction right so one, um, it was aiming exactly the same direction but one was twisted 45 one way and twisted so the two antennas polarity right. was 90 degrees out and and again you know from from the theoretical standpoint so much of this is this is what you want to do for best practice but in 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 application you again you find that it's only when you're at a fringe area that this stuff has has a significant effect and it can and it's not to say you won't be in fringe areas but if you've got good rf very little of this changes because you've got a good signal um okay so i'm just going to move over for one last thing and i'm going to go back to the 2.4 transceiver so this guy is good for worldwide and it is different than the 900 in the frequency agility. So this one we have um, we have high and low. Am I here? Yeah, 2.4. So I've got you know high and low here. Uh, on this guy, we actually have 36 hopping patterns. Okay. Um, and let me just see here. 
and the mixed is actually not available in this. It's grayed out. It's not available in um, in this window. Now, um, so we don't really need it because we've got a lot more places to hop to, and and the the way we split the band. So um, when you're laying out the uh, your your RF path, uh, one of the things that we do is on the belt packs you actually get two windows, one next to each other, uh, that both start out, if you're at the transceiver, at 99. And we have a data window that tells you your link quality in both directions. So I can tell my data quality going to my transceiver and how the transceiver is receiving me. And so I can monitor them. And there you go, great. You see the number 99, and I always get this wrong, Art. Is it 99 is how the transceiver is seeing the pack? That's right. The box basically emulates the transceiver, so it's the receive at the transceiver. Right. And it's not a linear scale. Basically, 95 to 95, you're rocking. 90 to 95, you might occasionally notice something, and what you'll notice here is not a background noise or a click or a pop, but maybe an occasional slight garble of a word. Um, 85 to 90, you may start to hear a little bit, but still highly intelligible. And 80 to 85, you're kind of on the range, on the edge of uh, range there. And the other uh, number is what's reported back from the receiver to the belt pack? Correct, correct. So we got both directions. Now, on both of these systems, one of the things that we can do is we can have multiple, trans, uh, multiple control units. So as an example, we had uh, we had American Idol and Dancing with the Stars in two adjacent studios, completely separate systems. They did not want a single system with, with one operator handling two studios. We have the sync port, which allowed us to time the two systems together. No audio passes, no control passes, but they do synchronize together. So we went in manually and, and matched the patterns so everybody was happy. But what happens is, we can reuse patterns. So think about it this way. If we had a, a linear area, right, and we had one and 14, and in between we had all 14 transceivers in a line. When we got to the end of range, if this, if this is one, sorry, I'm getting used to my backwards camera here. So if this is one and this is 14. When I get to the edge of range here, right, to, to the far side, here after 14 and I have a second system number one is way out of RF range number one is not over here right sorry that's right no number one's not here number one's all the way down here I can't hear it we can reuse in adjacent areas when there's not overlapping RF for a second system and is that automatically how, selected once they're synced or do you have to manually well, select that, that, that's a manual process but that's how we can achieve the kind of density we've done at NBC is by reusing by uh, doing antenna gain by using directional antennas and by doing this you can engineer a system that theoretically is a 72 user system and having multiples of those gets us into hundreds of users without conflict we do a combination of 2.4 and 900 there, and it's a testament to the 2.4 because at NBC, they have plenty of Wi-Fi like everybody else, but not creating a problem. Mark? I just wanted to add that when you initially build your system in the configuration file at Crewware, it automatically assigns hopping patterns as you drag and drop your radio transceivers out there. It's after that's done that you may choose to go in there and start reassigning hopping patterns because of where the radio transceiver is physically placed in the venue. Now, if you have 14 antennas out there and you go in and change one of them, it's going to be a duplicate of some other pattern. Will it flag you as an error or? Uh, it, it will and won't let you do that. And you, that's definitely something you would not want to do. So you'd have to yeah. unplug that antenna and change it and then replug the other antenna? Because you only have um, 14 hopping patterns right well well t tell me the scenario that you'd want to do that in uh you tell me what you, i just wondered 
you said after I after they were automatically assigned during creation. Right. The, the next door there was another system, and I wanted to change the hopping pattern of the antenna closer to that next door. Right. So I would go offline. I would change that one pattern, that one antenna, and then the corresponding antenna, I would have to change that one too if I had all 14. Is there so a screen I, to see all 14 hopping patterns at the same time as opposed to going into individual antennas? Yes, you can actually go right here to list view and here's your okay. hopping pattern. So you could change them right there? Yes, you can. Um, and, but you do have to save the configuration and, and set it back up again on an RF level. And that's generally a one-time thing. That's not something you do on a daily basis. The bell packs don't have to be resynced or anything. Um, the, um, if you just swap two numbers, I think you'll be fine. I think it'll repropagate. Um, right. But if you're if you're adding or you know making a major change, you uh, you might need to. So the 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 idea here is, um, I think we're in a in a good position for most of the guys who are really RF guys to have a toolkit, which was everybody said to me from day one, okay, your stuff's great, what happens when I got a problem? Well, I think this answers the question. We have a lot of ways to help you. Now, it's RF, right? It's alchemy. Until we get out there and we try it, we never know because we don't know what anybody else is doing, what they're bringing in. And there's lots of people messing with RF that don't know what they're doing. We had a scenario at one location where we had some, uh, we had some interference in the 900 band, and we tracked it down to a company that had installed a car gate opener at a parking lot in an arena that put a five watt power output on it. And that thing was probably hitting the moon. And you know, once we located the source and got that sorted out, but you know, we, you know, you guys that are on today, you're all the experts. This is what you do for a living. Lots of people who have access to this gear who are not. Um, so I uh, just want to pause for a second to see if there's any other specific questions and then uh, we'll hand it over to Art. No, that's pretty, pretty, uh, all, all, there we're only four questions right now, so. Okay, great. I'll switch over to Art. All right. All right. Have you got my screen? Don't have your camera though. It's yes, coming. I got it. There you go. All right, we're good to go. Okay, um, let's jump into uh, crewware. Um, what I'm going to hopefully accomplish here is a few things. Hopefully, give you a really good basic idea, foundation of what crewware is and and what it's used for, um, as well as hopefully while I'm going along here, touching on some of the new features, as Gary mentioned, um, I think it was early this week or last week, we introduced 1.8 um, as the latest uh, software slash firmware update. And that's actually gonna be the first thing I'm gonna to show you um, to kind of start off and show you how that's in, um, basically packaged with Crewware. And hopefully you'll get a chance and you've downloaded uh, the Crewware application. If you haven't, you can go to our website under uh, downloads and go ahead and download it. And that'll allow you to kind of play along as we go. So um, let's start out with, as I mentioned, just pointing out the fact that if you look over here across the, the top, you see all the different tabs. The one I'm actually gonna start with this time is the firmware tab. And the reason I wanted to start with this one is kind of wanted to show you how easy it is to, um, to update your system. So uh, there may be many of you out there that don't even have a system, but one of the nice things about the, the, the Crewware application is it's not a separate application to update, or even we can even downgrade firmware. If you, you know, let's say you're a rental company and you get in a new system and you have another system and you want to basically go back to your previous version, you can go either direction. Um, but anyhow, it is part of the Crewware application that you download. As you can see here on this tab, um, we have two sub tabs, uh, one called USB devices and one called network devices. I'll explain that in a minute. But essentially what you're doing is we're going to take 1.8. I'm actually not going to do it because it does take time to uh, update the devices. Depending on the device, it can be 
uh, fairly long for like the control unit and fairly short for like a hub. Um, but anyhow, um, you have two ways um, that you can do updates. One of them is uh, through USB, and that's probably the most common way. Um, and then we also have uh, a network update. And currently with network update, the only device that you can update through the network are the transceivers or the antennas, as some people call them. Um, so let's focus specifically on USB uh, devices. So um, I don't have anything connected at the moment, but the way this works is you essentially, if you remember, and I'll show you on the uh, belt pack, there is on every one of our devices, there is a micro USB port. And in the case of the belt pack, it's under a cap since uh, we're trying to keep the IP65 rating. Um, but anyhow, on that device, you would simply take uh, the supplied cable that came with it or any um, um, USB uh, micro to USB, um, plug that into your computer, and which by the way, you can do multiple devices simultaneously. So if you have a USB hub, um, let's say you have a six port hub or something like that, you could do six belt packs at the same time. But once you plug those devices in, you uh, hit the button that says scan for devices. And when you hit scan for devices, they'll pop up here and then you'll do your update from the application. Uh, the other option, as I mentioned, is a network update. And this is primarily for um, fixed installations. So if you've got uh, transceivers all around a building somewhere or a theater, let's say, um, you can update all of those devices over the network, over CrewNet. So there's really no need to connect in USB. So let's say you have a theater, for example, and you've got a transceiver up in the catwalk. You don't have to go up there with a laptop and essentially plug in directly to the transceiver to update that transceiver. You can do that over the network. Now, it does take a little bit longer than a USB update, but it is possible to do that uh, without actually having to physically go to the device and plug it in. So that's kind of where the, the firmware sits. And as I mentioned, you know, I'm gonna to try to point out some of the things that are different. Some of you may be familiar with previous versions, um, but um, this is just to let you know that uh, we are gonna cover some of the 1.8 uh, as well. So when you open up your application, you should see a screen similar to this well, with different windows. Um, the main grid or the system diagram screen, this is for building our system. We are currently offline. Uh, we are not connected to the hardware yet. Uh, we will do that just a, a few minutes. Um, but essentially, you're going to build your system here. Um, there is a, 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 a basically an alert window that keeps track of anything. If there's any errors or anything like that, they'll show up over here. That's primarily for online use uh, or live use. Same thing with the radio pack, what we call the radio pack farm internally. Um, but this is your radio pack display screen over here. And we'll talk about that more once we get into the actual live mode. Um, you also see across the top the different tabs. Um, there's a device management tab, and you'll start to see more uh, information on these populate as we build the system. And um, you'll see that as we go along. Um, the other thing to point out is there's different ways, and some people like to do work differently. Um, I was watching uh, the CP Communications seminar that was, I believe, last week, and actually those guys were excellent. They did a great job of explaining crewware, um, but they do things a little bit differently than I do. So I'll try to point out as many of those types of things as well so you can kind of follow along. Well, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually build a system. And just so to back up a little bit, we are actually building what we call a CCF, which is a CrewCom configuration file. So it'll end in a .ccf. And the whole purpose of the configuration file is essentially to tell your master control unit, which Gary covered in his part of the presentation, you're going to tell that control unit how to operate, essentially. And um, just to mention, the, the uh, CCF resides only on the master control unit. So if you have more than one control unit, uh, as mentioned, we can have up to four control units on a system. You essentially want to put that configuration file only on the master. If you have more than one control unit, you'll actually delete the control, I mean the uh, CCF off of any remaining um, control units because those will actually pick up all the configuration information from the master control unit. So let's get started. Um, one of the ways to do it um, is to create a system is you can always, and always if you're in the program, right click, you might find a menu that you never knew about. Um, so right clicking is one way to do it. And that's very simply, I just go to my grid, hit right click, and I can add a device, and it gives you drop downs for control units, hubs, radio transceivers, 
Um, that's one way to add devices. Let's, I'll add a control unit just to kind of start, and you'll see it'll drop an actual control unit on the grid. And uh, of course, you can put that anywhere. It doesn't matter where you put it on the grid. Um, then I'll also show you the other way to do it is I can come over here to the device toolbox on the left, bottom left, click on that, and you'll see essentially what a new feature that we added in 1.4 actually, which is uh, what's called My Toolbox. And this essentially will, uh, basically you can create your own toolbox based on the hardware that you actually have. So in our, my case, let's say I only have a, a CCU44, I don't have a CCU22, which is the two IO, um, two, two wire, two four wire IO. Um, I have a copper hub and a fiber hub, and then I'm, I'm using only 900 meg. Uh, although I will show you the uh, how you can combine 900 and 2.4. If I want to see all the different devices, um, essentially I just drop that down and I'll see all the different devices. You might see some things on here you've never seen before. Um, for instance, the CRT900AN. Uh, we have mentioned that 900 is only available in North America and what we call Oceania, or which is Australia, New Zealand. That's what the AN is for. And the uh, AN version is essentially a half band version they only allow half the band that we uh, have access to in the united states so yeah we've drug out a uh, ccu let's also uh, as a requirement really to create a system as gary mentioned is you need to have some kind of transceiver or antenna some people refer them in as antennas um, and then you simply just make your connection you'll see here the two crew net ports um, so if we were physically looking at the back of a crew net, uh, I'm sorry, a control unit, you would see two ports. You would see a copper only or an RJ45 labeled crew net one. And then you would also see one labeled crew net two. And next to that is a fiber SFP. Uh, ours is a dual strand SFP that comes supplied. But anyhow, that one's a fiber or copper. You have to decide which way you want to when I want to use the system. And on our case, we're going to actually use that particular connector and we're going to essentially just draw a line from one device to the other. And we've just made that connection. Okay, now one other thing to point out, and this is kind of important, um, is the fact that when you're building a system, when you go to deploy that system, the physical hardware has to match exactly to the ports that you're showing in your configuration file. So, for example, for me, if I send out a demo system, I'll print out this configuration file, and sometimes I'll print out a port list, which you can also do, and it will also it will basically tell you and show the user that when they get everything, you need to connect it up exactly like it shows in this diagram. Now, another little tip, and I think uh, Pete's uh, a big promoter of this as well, is one other thing you can do, um, because we don't have currently, where we're actually working on it, um, something called dynamic configuration, where you essentially turn on a control unit and start plugging hardware in, and you create a system as you go dynamically. Um, since that doesn't exist yet, let's say you get to a gig and you need to add another transceiver, one of the best things you can do is essentially overbuild the system. So in, let's say in this case, I'm only gonna have six users in one location, but who knows, somebody might come up to me and say, hey, we need coverage in the dressing rooms you can always add on another device and you can keep adding on however many you want. You can basically max out the system if you want to and you have 14 900 RTs on here or antennas on your system. And then when you go to the deploy the system, even though you may not have all that hardware plugged in, what will happen, and you'll see it when I go live, let's say I only have one tar RT plugged in, um, the other two will gray out. There's no problem with that. Even though the system will show an error status, it's just letting you know that those devices aren't there, even though they're part of the configuration file. The system will run just fine, no issues. And then you can plug in the devices as you need them. And you can also now with 1.8, you can actually unplug them as well and replug them back in, um, which was something we didn't officially support in 1.4, which is the previous version, but we do now support hot plugging or hot swapping depending on what you want to call it. Um, we do recommend you leave at least 10 seconds before you plug and unplug, um, but it does allow you to officially now hot plug um, transceivers or any device actually onto the system. So anyhow, back to our, our basic setup. Uh, we've got, we've has to have at least one control unit. 
Of course, we can have, as Gary mentioned, you can have multiple control units, which you can tie together. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, let's say um, this particular line here is green. As you see, it automatically draws green lines uh, with the exception of the fiber hub, and you'll see why. If I right click on this line, um, since I'm going between an either or port on both of them, I could make that a fiber connection. So in that instance, I could have, let's say, a long run from my control unit all the way out to my transceivers, which are, let's say, out, outside somewhere. Um, I can run fiber out there, and you designate that by simply right-clicking on the line and then uh, changing that to a fiber connection. You can also make adjustments and make your drawings all pretty and everything, which uh, some people like to do, and I've actually seen some really, really good drawings out there. Uh, in my experience. So anyhow, back again, you can have multiple control units. And if you remember on um, the back of the control units, that's all your IO. So if you need simply more IO, you can just add another control unit as part of the system. Now a control unit can come off of another control unit, or it could even come off of a hub if we wanted to do it that way. It depends on how you want to set it up. That's completely up to you. So if I wanted to, I could actually have this go into a hub and then go out to a control unit and do it that way. Uh, really depends on how you want to use. The only time you cannot connect, or the only kind of exception to connecting devices is the only thing I can put on this loop port. Um, and let me show you real quick on the back of a transceiver, and Gary had a picture of it, but I'll show it actually to you. On the back of the transceiver, you'll notice uh, one that says net power. And if you look at the software, this is the one that says net power. That's the dual connector, which you see the SFP there, as well as the uh, Ethercon connection. And then next to that is the loop. Now the loop connection supports only other transceivers. In other words, I could not connect a hub to that loop connection. I can only correct connect other transceivers. And I believe it was mentioned, but you can have a total of seven additional transceivers on top of your first transceiver. Uh, I'll also mention the fact that if you're going to connect fiber to a transceiver, this is going to require a power supply. Uh, we haven't perfected power over fiber yet. <laughs> but anyhow, once you get to that first transceiver, then you can daisy chain out copper, and that'll give you power over crew net to the other devices, and I can have seven more. Um, of course, that's limited by cable quality, cable length, things like that. But there is an LED on the back of the transceiver that will let you know if there are any kind of powering issues. Uh, in the line of transceivers, but you can daisy chain, which is very convenient. If you remember from Gary's presentation, if you need more users, you add more transceivers, and that's an easy way to do that uh, in one location. We even make a mount that puts two transceivers right next to each other that basically gives you um, more more users. Yes, sir. Um, Art, just one question that came up as you were doing the configuration that Dan had asked. Um, will the system continue to work as expected other than losing connected ports if the master goes offline? Yeah, if the master goes offline, um, at the way we sit right now with the current firmware is everything, well, you'll lose everything. Yeah, there is that, no that call is, over. That is ahead, the there is a uh, There is a long-term plan uh, for us to implement the system that when you have more than one control unit, the second control unit would take over and so the system would continue to run, uh, but that's a little bit, a little ways off that that is part of the, the grand plan. That's right. Yeah, great point. Um, yeah, if you'll notice, when I drag o drug over my first control unit, it automatically created that one as the master. And then you notice when I brought my second one over, it says none. Um, if I double click on that, and this is kind of maybe getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I'm going to double click on this CU and it will take me into the menu. And you'll notice here, there's something called sync priority. Um, this actually technically is not working well at all. That's what Gary was just talking about. Um, you could assign, you can even do it now. And it'll, if you go back to the, to here, it will show you that it is set up as a secondary. Right now, it's just a, it's just changing the text. It's not actually doing it. But the whole purpose of that is master, secondary, tertiary. So it will kind of basically revert to the other control unit. Now, of course, you still, if let's say you lost power to your master, in that case, even um, anything plugged into that I.O. wise is going to go down. So you'd have to find a quick way to, to move that over as well. But anyhow, that's all that's all coming, hopefully, in the future, in the near future. But anyhow, that's um, 
essentially setting up a basic system. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the hub also comes in the uh, a fiber format. So if I wanted to, uh, I could come off of here and like, let's see, I need to go to another location and then run fiber. Let's go ahead and add a couple of 2.4 transceivers out there just to show how we can mix and match um, different frequencies. And we could even put them in between each other. So let's say I'm gonna run fiber and you'll see here it's a purple line now. And off of that, I'm actually gonna daisy chain to a 900. You'll see in here, it doesn't matter if it's 2.4 or 900. As um, long as it's on the network, it doesn't even matter if it's, if it's looping off of a 2.4 transceiver, that makes no difference. Once again, this is a fiber hub, so there's no way to change this to copper because it's only fiber ports on the outside of that. Um, as I mentioned, the SFPs that we do are the dual strand. Um, we have a lot of people, with, including Pete and any, many other people, are using different types of SFPs. I haven't heard of any real issues with that. You can use single strand, bi-directional, uh, dual mode, multi-mode. Um, so far, that's, uh, that's all been very good in terms of people using different types of fiber connections. So obviously this is a fairly big system. So um, I'm gonna actually next, actually show you uh, what you would, I would typically do next is once we've created all of our hardware, um, what I will typically do is then I'll go in and start labeling things. And once again, there's multiple ways to do things like this. Um, I think Gary kind of showed um, the this particular view, which is a device view. And that allows you to kind of toggle through device by device and see um, different things. So if I wanted to make this one label it the master, we have typically have two device names. There's a long name and a short name. And the in general, the long name will show up in crewware and the short name will show up on the belt packs or other devices typically. Well, yeah, like the control unit or the, the belt pack, something not in crewware, um, just because of limitations on the, on the screen sizes. So that's the reason of the for the two different long name, short names. Now I could label them here. I can go to list view, and that will show me um, same same information, except in a different way to do it. I can still enter information there. I can make changes and so forth. Okay, I'm going to go away from this for just a second. Go back to my system diagram. But in general, I can label all my transceivers. I highly recommend if you're going to build a system labeling your transceivers. The reason for that is that way you'll be able to keep track of where the, the lo actual locate, physical location of those transceivers are. So like this could say Arena Bowl 1, Arena Bowl 2, Arena Bowl 3, whatever. Depending on whatever you want to label them, you can label them whatever you want. You can label your hubs as well and um, all, any of your RTs. And you'll see why um, as we go through that it, the importance of labeling, um, not only for while you're in live mode of being able to see where people are, where they're located, um, they'll be able to see that even on their on their individual belt packs. Um, so anyhow, after you get all that all labeled and everything, and you're all set up and ready to go, you got your hardware pretty much laid out. Um, once again, the, we're creating a system configuration file. And once we have this all complete, um, we will load that to the control unit. And we'll go through that, that a little bit. But the control unit only handles one um, CCF file. Um, quick little note, uh, one of the additions of 1.8, uh, and this was based on customer feedback, on the control unit itself, it's kind of, I don't think you can see the display here, but if I move it over just a little bit, you might be able to. Yeah, anyhow, on the front panel of the control unit now, you have the ability to see what CCF is on the control unit. And I'll take this opportunity to also mention that once you create your CCF and you load it onto your control unit, technically you don't need crewware anymore. So if you have a nice, on a small system or something, you don't really need to monitor it live with software. Um, you can actually run the system, no problem. It doesn't require crewware to run the actual system, the hardware. Okay, but nice, nice little feature now. You can actually tell what CCF is stored on the control unit itself. Okay, so let's keep going. The next thing I usually do is I create conferences or simply these are just um, ways of communication. Some people call them party lines. That's exactly what they are. We call them conferences. You can create up to currently up to 64 conferences, um, which I've, my experience is typically more than enough for, for most applications. Uh, we do plan on expanding that at some point, but right now it's currently 64. It's very simple to do. 
Um, there's already one stage announced conference that's built in and uh, that just is something that's uh, a default um, and you can use that and assign it. You know, when we talk about profiles, you'll see what that's used for. Um, but once you've uh, created conferences, you just simply, or to create a conference, you simply just hit the add button. And however many, let's say we need six conferences in this case. I just keep hitting add conference, uh, six. And now I have six conferences. I've created six um, basically talk paths. And then I can go in and name them. Again, I'm not gonna take up time to do a lot of labeling and everything. Um, but you are able to label each one however you want to. Um, that's all very much customizable. And once again, I highly recommend that you uh, label uh, conferences as well, because um, that's really, that's gonna be what shows up on the buttons of the actual belt packs. So, so that's kind of important. Uh, we didn't really talk a whole lot about ISO, um, but there is an ISO function um, that allows you to essentially create another conference on top of the main conference. And then that is actually accessed on the belt pack by pushing in on the uh, volume button. Um, that's one way of doing an ISO. Some people just create another conference as an ISO, and that's another way to do it. Really depends on your workflow and how you want to do it. Yes, sir. It's the, uh, a little bit about the ISO. <clears throat> so in the past, ISO or wireless talk around on a belt pack generally meant disconnection from the wired system and everybody who was on your channel heard whatever the, this was. This is quite a bit different. First of all, each conference can have its own um, ISO function. So if you have a four volume belt pack with four different conferences, they can each have one. And then you can decide who in that conference gets the information. And when you press the ISO button, it does not disconnect your wired system. You still hear the original conversation so if we were on a lighting channel and there were eight people on and Art and I had ISO enabled as the uh, LD and the board operator and Art pressed his ISO button, I would continue to hear everything plus Art's voice. And Art would say, your spotlight operator just missed a cue. No one else heard that, but I did not miss any cues because I still heard everything on top of it. And now I can respond back the same way. <clears throat> you can have as many people on as you want, really creates a four listen eight talk belt pack or a or a two volume pack which is two listen four talk pete i thought they're always momentary yes whereas the buttons can be latching or momentary that's correct, correct. that's the only real difference between creating the iso so if you want to have an extended conversation with your iso group put it on a regular conference right that's yeah, unless correct. you run out of buttons on your profile, which in most cases that's not the case, but you're right. Okay, uh, well, let's continue on. We've created our conferences. One of the other things we've added um, in version um, 1.8, um, actually it applies to profiles, is the ability to select multiple profiles and delete them. I forgot it wasn't on conferences. Anyhow, we'll move on to the next one. But you can delete conferences if it turns out you didn't need a particular conference, you can um, delete those pretty simply. Um, so this one, we'll just leave it like it is. Well, anyhow, so once you've created your conferences, um, there's a couple things you can do. What I typically do is I go back to my control units and now I'm going to assign those conferences to the IO, the physical IO on the control unit. So I'll go back to my master and I, once again, I double clicked on that and then it brings up this screen. I'm going to move things around a little bit so you can get more uh, surface area. Uh, one of the things we did with 1.8, little thing, is we've added back. Originally, in some of the earlier versions, uh, we had pictures of the back panel. And we've added that back into 1.8, which I think is nice because it kind of gives you an idea of all the different connections on the back without actually going to the physical hardware. Um, but one thing you have to do next is, well, you don't have to. If you're a wireless-only system, um, you wouldn't need to make these assignments. Um, but what you typically do is once you've created your conferences and then you assign them to the various ports on the back of the control unit. As you can see here, we've got four two-wire connections. If this was a CCU 22, it would be half as many um, for both two-wire and four-wire. And you then assign your conferences. 
Uh, in this case, let's put audio on a two-wire conference. Um, we will decide what flavor that is, and we'll make this one ClearCom. Gives you a little bit of a warning, and we can get rid of that if we need to. Um, in case we were actually live, it would uh, kind of give you a warning that we're changing the format. Um, then you can also name the port by default, and if you look on the back of the control unit, you can see the, the port numbers here, one, two, three, four, then it goes five, six, kind of hard to see, five, six, seven, eight. Those correspond to these as well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And by default, the, the same nomenclature is used down here in the port name, but you know you can change that. And once again, I would typically change those and you wanna ideally make it match or be similar to whatever conference you're selecting so you can keep keep track of that. Um, so that's done. You can, of course, adjust input output levels. Um, you can turn on call, mic kill, echo cancellation is on by default. Um, we're not live, but if we were live, this null port would be on and that would allow you to null um, that particular port. There's also a null all function. If you come down here, there's actually, this will give you the, the actual readings of the nulling. Uh, and it'll show you if you do an auto null, it will give you all the values for the resistance, inductance, and capacitance, and amplitude. Um, we're not going to do that. But anyhow, that will allow you to do your auto null there. Um, if you're going to set up some four wires, that's pretty easy to do as well. And you just assign them as you need them, and you just need to turn them on as needed. And of course, you can label those as well. Um, you can also change levels and so forth there. So now once we've got our conferences, we've got all of our I.O. set up. And then next thing that I typically do is I go and set up my profiles. Now profiles, just to give you a brief overview of what they are, uh, on other systems, some people call them roles, uh, but profile basically determines how the belt pack or the radio pack is going to operate. Okay, Gary, did you have a... Yeah, uh, just b before we go too much further uh, about the I.O., can we go back to the I.O. page for a second, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, so ART has two control units on here. When the second control unit is added, it's not a separate I.O. That I.O. feeds the entire system. So whether he's on the first uh, control unit or the second control unit, any one of those I.O. ports can feed any one of the conferences of the, that are in the entire system. So it doesn't, it's just not an add-on for the RF, it actually grows the system larger. So it is an add-on to the ports. It, correct, That's you right. double the amount of ports. Right. Doubles the ports or adds two if it's a two-channel conference. You can use combos of two and four-channel control correct. units, right? Correct, but they all feed everything in the system. That's right. Mark? And add on to that you can actually take and decentralize with our decentralized network you're capable of geographically placing a control unit 10 kilometers away from the other one and you could actually use that our system our network is a bridge from one hardwire connection to another hardwire connection across crew net and still have the accessibility of that from the wireless users yeah that's a great point yeah, it's a great way. As was mentioned earlier, um, the control unit is not only used for creating the network, it also, of course, gives you all your I.O. So if you need more I.O., you add more control units. Um, but in addition to that, uh, if you remember, the control unit also determines how many belt packs you can have on your system. One control unit supports 18 belt packs. If you need to go beyond that, you add another control unit, then you get 36, and then so on and so forth, all the way up to 72 by having four control units. Okay, so jumping into uh, profiles, as I mentioned, the profile essentially tells the belt pack how to operate. It's uh, similar to what's called a roll on other systems, um, but essentially it's telling the belt pack where conferences need to reside, how buttons operate, and so forth. Now, there's two ways to go about uh, a profile, um, and I've seen it both ways. Um, probably the more common way is to have essentially a profile for every user. Now, the advantage of having a profile for every user is it allows you to cut, customize each individual user um, as needed. So if somebody comes back and says, hey, I need the audio channel over here and I need the lighting channel over here, um, but that wasn't part of the original profile, you can do that on an individual person basis. 
Um, the other way to operate is you can have a profile used for a specific use or role or a specific job. So let's say you want to give all your spots the same profile so that if something changes, it changes on everybody's. Now, in addition to that, those are the global settings. There's also individual user settings. So aside from the profile, there's actually like individual mic gains and noise gates and things like that. Um, those can be set individually, even though the profiles may be the same. So back to my spotlight uh, example, even though you have, let's say, four spotlight operators, um, each one of them still has the ability to adjust uh, individual mic gains and et cetera. And you'll see that as we as we go through it. But let's say I've got four packs, fairly straightforward system. Oh, okay, this is one gotcha, which I think was even brought up on um, the other uh, seminar that went on, which I always forget about, is, and I'm gonna delete um, some profiles here. Just a second. Delete the profile, and you'll see why in a second. Delete the profile. The reason being is when you create a profile, this is the default that comes up. It calls up, it calls it an RP profile number one, RPP one short name. This is the key here though. You'll notice it says CRP 44 2400. Now for me, I've got 2.4 and 900 uh, RTs on my system. So I may need this one, but let's say you're only doing a 900 meg system. Um, when you hit the add profile button, it automatically puts a 2.4 profile out there. And it, in this case, it's a four by four, so four volume pack, 2.4. If it was a, a 2.2, two, it'd be a two, uh, two volume pack and so on and so forth. So this is a little bit of a gotcha to, to, to note. Um, the way to get around that, there's actually an easy way to do it, is if I double click on the profile, that opens up all the details of that profile. The first thing I would do is I would create a, a kind of a base profile. And the first thing I would need to do, and actually, and this was also brought up in the last seminar, um, one of the quick ways to do it, if you didn't have any uh, 2.4 transceivers on your system, you would see nothing in this scan list. As Gary mentioned, this is a list of all the transceivers on the system. And we'll talk a little bit about more of that later. Um, but in this case, I'm seeing the 2.4 transceivers on there. But let's assume I'm doing a 900 only system. I will switch over to 900. Now I see all of my 900 transceivers. So that's where the little bit of a gotcha is, is if you're running a 900 only system, make sure you switch the your first profile that you create to 900. And then if you want to, you can create kind of a base um, uh, profile. In our case, I'm just gonna kind of do, go down the line and select conferences. But what I'm doing here in this part of the profile is I'm essentially assigning what conferences show up on which buttons. And the way it works is it's A, B, C, D. That's how they correspond to the actual belt pack and A, B, C, D with the volume knobs. Um, but once I figure out what conference is gonna show up on that belt pack, then I can determine how the button is gonna work. Um, is it gonna be momentary? Is it gonna be latching? Is it gonna be always on? Typically, I set it for momentary. Um, and then I will sometimes put a latch, depending on the user and so forth, um, but let's set these all to momentary. And then um, to explain the ISO a little bit further, if you remember when we set up the conferences, we made the lighting conference um, ISO enabled. So then what you would do, I don't have anybody on lighting, so I will switch this over to lighting. And now I will have the, if, the reason I had to do that, by the way, is if I try to click ISO here, nothing happens because that particular conference, back at the conferences, is not ISO enabled. So I can now come over to my lighting, click that on. So go back to Gary's example. Let's say he and I needed to be able to talk to each other. This could be my profile. And then Gary would have his own profile. And on his profile, he would also have that box checked. So now whenever I press in on the lighting channel, which is the B button uh, on the volume knob, I would be able to talk to him privately. Another kind of cool feature, which uh, I think is very useful, is uh, we have a min and max volume level setting. And this is actually pretty cool because uh, it keeps you from basically the user um, on that particular profile of being able to turn the volume all the way down. So let's say there's a critical channel, uh, the program channel or some you know channel where somebody, let's say somebody continuously you know says that their volume knobs all the way down or they're hitting it or something like that. 
um, you can actually set this as a minimum volume. So that way now I can never turn the volume down less than five. So that's for programming all the different buttons. In addition to the main channel buttons or conference buttons, there's also two function buttons on the actual bell pack. And those function buttons can be assigned from here. And by default, you get one of them with stage and outs. Let's say we're not going to use stage and outs, so I just make that none. So nothing will show up on that particular function button. But let's say on function button two, um, I want to do a call. So I wanted to make it, and there's two different ways that you can set up calls. Um, one of them is call on talk or active talk, and one of the other way is call on conference. So let, if I switch this over, and by the way, it will list uh, all the used conferences for this particular profile on here. So I'm going to select audio. So now whenever I press the function button number two, it will actually call everybody on the audio conference and it's going to send it out of the hardwire if I'm using two wire and I'm also on the wireless. So let's say I want to disable hardwire and I want it just to go out on all the wireless users and I will call all the, everybody that's on that conference. The other option is I call on active talk and call on active talk means that if I'm pressing, let's say the audio uh, talk button, uh, and I want to call uh, that everybody on that conference, I hit the function button number two, and now we'll call everybody on that particular uh, conference. So, yes, sir. So the, the, the function buttons one and two can't take conferences, only those pull down items, right? I couldn't um, put a conference on the side. Yeah, the only one you officially get is the stage announce. Right which is really just a one-way uh, conference. Yeah, stage announce and call and relay functions, those kinds okay. of things. Okay, and on, a, on a, a sort of associated question, the aux in and aux out, do they form a true four-wire if they're put into a conference? The okay, same so conference? They're, they function differently than one another. The aux in is a ring tip sleeve quarter inch and that can feed up to 10 different conferences and you assign them. But let's say you only put it in one. Okay. And then the out, you put that, put the out in another one. Now the out, the out is a single output. Okay. We only have one output. You choose any one. Channel. Right. I'm going to tell you about only using one on each side. Okay. And they're so, both put into a conference. Does that make a four wire and IE? Does it mix minus itself automatically? Or will I hear on the out everything I put on the in? I, or vice versa, will honestly, anything on the out go into the in? First time that be asked that question, I have to, we'll have to get that answer. Yeah. Yeah, I would think so if, if, you, if you had an option. So if you're only using one conference in here and they're both in the same conference, they automatically become a, a, a fifth four wire in i i believe that is the way it operates but i haven't tried it i'll have to confirm it yeah the key is does it mix minus right 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 okay, okay so back to the profile uh and the function buttons one of the other functions on the um the function button is relay and relay, as you can see here, is grayed out. Um, the reason being is the relays are actually set up on the relay page, and I'm going to show you that. Um, and then, of course, stage announce is the other option, which we had turned off earlier. But the way you set up a relay, uh, which, by the way, there are a total of uh, four relays that are available besides the, the stage announce. And on relays are actually physical connections on the back of the control unit. Um, so as you can see here, um, that's the reason we had to go to the control unit um, page and setup page because you see stage announce is relay number one. This is all on a D sub, by the way, a 15 pin D sub. Um, there's relay two, three, four, and those can be assigned from this particular page. And then I'll go back to the profile and show you how that kind of fits in. Um, so if I go to, for instance, uh, relay number two, what I can do is I can add my profile to that relay and under function button one, 
it gives me a little bit of a, 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 a warning because if I was live, I, that would cause issues because it does have to change um, the profile. So anyhow, I've assigned to relay to my profile or my pack and on function button one, that should trigger relay number one, I'm sorry, relay number two, which is this one right here, which by the way, you notice if I'm, as I'm clicking on here, it lights up. That's actually a way you can, a little bit of a tidbit of information. You can actually test the relay from pressing on the actual um, relay display here. So anyway, I'll go back to my profile and now I see that I have a relay assigned. So, and it's relay number two. If I were to have changed uh, the name of that relay, let's say I want it to be a light or something like that. If I wanted to, I could have changed that. Uh, let's see here, why is it like changing? Did I gonna... Oh, right, light, whatever. Can't spell. But anyhow, if I go back here, you'll see that's the name of the button as well. So now when I look at the function button, it'll say next to it, it'll say right or let's say it's for a light or any particular thing that you want to trigger. So anyhow, that's how you set up a, a relay. And those that basically can be decided, can be either function button one or function button two. And you can set up multiple relays. Now, as I mentioned earlier within the profile, once you set up the, um, the global profile settings, um, then you can come down here and set up user level settings. So as I mentioned earlier, um, even though these are basically the default of the profile. So I'm creating my own uh, profile. So I can set a custom gain amount, um, turn on noise gate, whatever I want to do, say, change display functionalities, display timeout, so forth. Um, that's all going to be, when I load that to the pack, that's actually all going to be loaded into the pack, including the user settings. Now that doesn't mean once I get further like into the show and I need to make a mic gain adjustment, I can still do that on the individual pack level. And you'll see that in live. Uh, one thing I kind of skipped over is Gary mentioned about the scan list. Um, and in the scan list, this is where you select which transceivers this particular pack or this particular profile will be able to log into. So let's say I only wanted to be able to log into two of the transceivers that I have on my system. Uh, I can do that very easily here just by selecting them as necessary. Um, if I go to list view, and I go back to device management and go to list view. Now let's kind of go through and make sure that we've got everything set up. I've got my control unit set up, all of my IO set up like I want to. Um, here's a list of all my transceivers. It was mentioned earlier when Gary was showing about transceivers um, that this is another way you can actually, quicker way to actually label all your transceivers rather than on an individual uh, icon based way to do it. And this is also where you can change hopping patterns and functionality as well in, in an easier uh, environment, in my opinion. Uh, when I click on radio packs, nothing's showing up because radio packs are not something that you create offline. You create the profile offline and then you upload that to the radio packs once you're live within the system. And then there are some hub settings, basically it's just a, a label uh, setting for, uh, for the hub. Now, another new feature that we've added to 1.8 is something called group management. And group management allows you to essentially group profiles. So let's say there's 10 people who are your lighting crew. They've all got their own profiles. Each profile has that person's name. Now I want to kind of monitor all of them simultaneously as one group. I can create groups. So I'm going to just quickly create four groups. You do it just like you do with conferences. You hit add group and it, and it goes down and it actually does that. Um, actually, I want to back up just a little bit to profile because I did forget one thing. We had talked about creating a base profile and then the other function, uh, and I just double click by the way, is I can clone a profile. So once I create my base profile, um, then I can clone it. And it's, it's warning me that I have some relay assignments and uh, do I want to include those? And let's say, yes, I do, but I don't have to. And now I can just sit here and keep cloning however many profiles that I need. So if I need, I can go back to my list and I can see all the different profiles. And then I can customize each one as necessary. So let's say I go back to you have 10 users. You would basically clone that 10 times and then you can customize each one. You're muted, Gary. Hi, I'm back. Just because uh, uh, just I'm being cautious on time, a couple of questions had come up which probably could have been addressed a little bit earlier that I just don't want to make sure that we miss. 
because uh, I know we still got more explaining to do too. So yeah. Dan asked the question, do I understand correctly that the two wire connections don't gang for RTS modes? So two wire one and two wire two can't be combined internally to take the two channels of the RTS feed. Okay, so first, the way you get to the IO um, is for a uh, for an RTS, if you want both wires, you would use an external splitter and come into both ports. Or you could actually loop, uh, because we have a male and female, and you could loop from one to the second two wire, and we can handle two wire one and two wire two. So even, now, though, it's a, even though it's an RTS feed looping in there, you correct. select which channel you actually want to pick off of it at each two-wire input, correct? Correct. So, so where do you so, do that? Right. So so we can do that now. We can send... Um, oh, I see. Right. So we can send two-wire two one and two-wire two for RTS. We can send them both to the same conference. Yeah, that's that's what I did here. Right. What I can't do is send two wire one to several different conferences. Right. So the input can can be sent can can both go in so we can combine, but we're not a splitter that way. So I can't take RTS one and send it to audio and to lighting and to well, this. if if, right. if you use your second pair of two wires, you could wire it into those as well. That's true, absolutely. Um, and and again, just uh, real quickly for John Christie, had a couple of questions. Uh, recommended SFPs that are compatible. They're really just stock, quite honestly. I wanted to test it with multi-mode, and I ordered a, a jumper cable and two SFPs off of Amazon for about $30, just plug them in and they work. And I know CP and many others have been using a single fiber multiplexed uh, just to keep the fiber count down. Um, so we've had good luck. Uh, as a company, we say we support the LC dual because that's what we ship with and we know it works, but we haven't had any complaints yet of people running into problems. And the last one from John, um, he asked about uh, working with Telos and do we see AES67IO uh, and connections working with them. The, um, the entire discussion about uh, Dante AES67 and all the different flavors, Livewire, all the different flavors is an important one. Uh, much of our customer base is still very, uh, very much uh, using two wire and four wire. And there are many solutions to get from there into one of the routing systems. But for us to put that in internally would add a significant cost to the product, and also it's pretty much of a moving target. We have a list of a tremendous amount of lists of uh, things that we want to implement in hardware and software. And so for the time being, we want to leave our focus on the comm system and on the RF and leave it to uh, the outside world to interface whatever flavor that you happen to need. Okay, okay. And, is that uh, it for questions? That's it for questions. Okay, um, let's continue on with group function um, and then we'll switch over to live mode and show you some of the things there and then we'll move on to a microcom. Um, so as I mentioned, there is a new function called grouping and uh, grouping takes your profiles and groups them however you want. I just created a couple, four groups here and you can also, of course, change colors, color of the text, the color of the background. You'll see where that comes in once we go to live mode and some of the groups I've already created but essentially it allows you to customize the bar that, um, that the way the groups are shown. So once you've created the groups, it's similar to like when you create a conference, you hit add group, create as many groups you want. And then if I double click, click on a group, in this case, I'll double click on cams, then you'll see a list of those profiles that I created earlier. Um, now I can assign those profiles to groups. And it's pretty easy to do. You just select, and it can be multiples. Let's say these two guys are going to be part of the cams. I just select on the left and then hit the arrow button and it moves it over to the right. So now these two radio packs are part of the camera group. Um, if I wanted to go add somebody to the rigging group, 
Okay, now I've got that group. So this is where you make your actual group assignments. There's nobody assigned to lighting, nobody on audio. But yeah, this is where you assign your groups. And then one, if I click on that group, you'll see on the right side who's assigned to those groups. And once again, this will make a little more sense once we get to the live mode, um, but this is where you set up those groups. Now, once again, once we've created, we're pretty much done creating our configuration file. Once again, this can be done offline or it is being done offline. Um, there are some things you can do online, but the majority of the hardware building um, is done offline. You can't, add, you can't add conferences and groups and profiles while you're live, but the hardware aspect of it, um, you cannot remove or add um, actual hardware devices um, while you're live. So anyhow, once we've got this all saved, or once we've got it all created, then we would save it. And we would typically save that file wherever you want to save your configuration files. Once you've saved it and you're connected to the network using the IP address and the LAN connector, um, one way of getting that configuration into the control unit, as I mentioned before, the control unit supports one con configuration file. One way to do that is if I was connected, um, I would actually be able to upload the file. Um, so I would upload the file and that would do it through the network. And once it uploads it into the, con the uh, control unit, you uh, essentially it'll ask you to reboot the system. Now, one thing I will mention, 1.8, a great feature that was uh, added is when you reboot the system, it used to be you have to reboot all of your hardware. So if you had, let's say, a hub in a remote location and it was powered off of a power supply, you'd have to go disconnect the power, repower it in order to reboot the system. You don't have to do that anymore. When you reboot the master, it reboots everything else. So that's not necessary anymore. So that's a nice so feature what, to have. What, what changes to the system require a reboot? Um, anything hardware related is one thing. So removing or adding, let's say a transceiver as part of the configuration file. That's why your idea of overbuilding a system is kind of important currently. Um, the other part would be rebooting the system would be what Gary talked about earlier, uh, hopping patterns. With if you switch from full to high or full to low or full to mixed, um, that will require a system reboot. And also in that case, it will require just, uh, repairing your packs. But, well. if, but if the antennas are overbuilt and you move an antenna from one port to another port, it doesn't have to be rebooted, right? As long as it's already been pre-programmed. That's correct. That is correct. Absolutely. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do now is go into live mode and uh, I'm gonna close this. It's asking me if I wanna save it. I'm not gonna save it, but per typically you would save it. And it basically clears out the screen. Um, I've already kind of set it up ahead of the time. I've got the uh, my control unit sitting on my network and this is the IP address that was assigned to it using DHCP. Um, so I select that device ID or IP address and I click OK, and what it's doing is basically logging in and it's looking at the uh, CCF or the control, uh, the configuration file for my system. So it's showing me that I've got one control unit and two RTs on my system configuration file. As you can see here, I just got an error and this grayed out. This is what we were talking about earlier and also goes to the fact of uh, overbuilding a system. Um, so now you see that that particular transceiver is offline. If I were to plug it in, it would basically boot up, and then once it's configured, it will it will show up, and it'll show just like this particular uh, transceiver here. Um, right off the bat, you see where I've created my groups. Um, I've uh, this is where I was talking about the different colors for the groups. Now I have the ability to display mm -hmm. my radio packs in groups. Um, another thing that was added in 1.8 is what we call uh, unused packs, and this is basically packs that are paired to the system. A pack has to be paired through the USB port uh, into the control unit. And this is showing me that I actually have two packs that are paired to this control unit that are not on at the moment. So the nice thing about that is, is if, as we mentioned before, you have a limit of 18 users per pack, I'm sorry, per control unit. So this would show me how many um, were, were set up for that particular control unit. Yes, Mark. Hey, uh, one thing I want to point out is if you're on a gig, and you've got an error light flashing on your software, you can clear that out by going to the event log and hitting clear. And what it'll do is give you an OK status. So from that point on, you know that the system is running and everything's good. And then if something else goes wrong, you'll get the error message. That's right. Yeah, great point. 
Um, yeah, the, the only time really to be majorly concerned is this: if this were to turn red, and I forget the actual status that comes up, but that's a pretty major one. Very rarely see that, if ever. Um, but this is just telling me, and if you see that error, you can come down here and tell me. It's just saying, or it'll come to, it tells you um, that there's a device mini, missing. Area number two is missing. Um, go ahead, Pete. Is there a way to uh, shrink the display on the left, the belt packs, so they're not divided by department? Yes, there if is. If you had uh, all, a lot of belt packs or even shrink smaller than the view of a radio pack. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. There are different views. That's actually a good segue. Um, there's a, several things you can do. Um, you can hide windows altogether. Um, that's what these little triangles are for. And so, for instance, I want to hide all my unused packs, get rid of those. I'm creating more area now. Um, also, I can zoom in my configuration if I want to. Uh, I like to be able to see that pretty well. Uh, but to ask, answer your question, Pete, yes, you can group things or, I'm sorry, view things differently. First of all, there's different types of uh, ways to view. Right now, we're in tile view. If I were to go to icon view, that gives you a lot more uh, area. So if you have many, many packs, this is a great way to view. You'll still get status information um, like your link quality and, of course, the names of the packs and so forth. Um, there's also, I can now organize by. This is actually a new feature as well. Right now, it's set to organize by group and whether it's ascending or descending. Uh, another way to do it is by transceiver. So now you can see all my packs, it get rid, gets rid of all the groups, but I can see which transceivers are logged into, I'm sorry, which belt packs are logged into which transceiver or antenna. And then um, there's another device detail view. So if you have a lot of packs, this is actually probably the best way to go because it will essentially list them all um, in a vertical order. Um, but taking up uh, more horizontal space rather than vertical space, and you can make a little more room. So there's various ways to, to view it. So the only thing you really gain in icon view is you can see the volume and when they actually push a button. Right, that's true. Yeah, you can see the volume setting, push buttons, a little more information, RSSI. Um, you sh it shows the transceiver that they're logged into, the name of the pack, and also the uh, now we've actually in 1.8 added also the profile name as part of that as well. The profile name and the pack name are actually two separate things. The, the pack name refers to the actual hardware the pro, and the profile name refers to the profile. Also on your push button part, uh, if I push a talk button on any of the packs, also you'll see it shows up here. By the way, this is a real-time view and it also shows up up here on the transceiver um, that somebody has a talk button pushed here. Um, if I double click on any of these, and it could be from any of these views, if I even I was in this view, uh, if I double click on it, it basically opens up the details for that particular pack. And in my case, this is the pack I'm using, which is number four. And you can see as I press buttons or change volumes, you would be able to see the changes as they happen. So in real time, you'll be able to see all that. Um, it shows you all the profile information here. This is not where you edit the profile. This is where you're just basically monitoring the profile. Yes, Pete? So that would be the close, the fastest way to adjust level on a person's mic. We'd double That's click right. on his icon and then just change the mic gain, which That's is right. only for that bell pack, right? That's correct. And does that mic gain stay through a, re a reset? Yes. Yes, it does. Now, you'll notice here, see the little dot? That's telling me that what I changed is different from my initial profile that I created. So that's how I can know that. So like for instance here, I changed it at some point, um, but it's letting me know that it's different. If I wanted to revert back to the original profile, I hit restore, and now it's gonna update my profile. You can see there with the progress bar, and now everything's set back to what I had originally set it at. But and you're right, these are. That change on the pack takes about five seconds or so? Uh, maybe a little less it's usable. It, I think it, it also seconds. depends on your configuration file size. But yeah, yeah, I would say no more than five seconds, if that. Yeah, it's, gen so it's generally about two seconds, but an important differentiation. The profile kind of sends up everything about the pack. Whether you're making changes or you're resetting, it's resetting the pack. The settings in this screen on the left are actually in real time. So it doesn't go through that two-second loop. Oh, okay. Uh, except lines. except for when he clicked on restore. Right, but right now, if my, if my, if uh, Art just adjusts the mic gain, it's a real-time 
betting just like you were doing in a local land your pack. That's right. So it, it, it so you'd have to warn the person your pack is going to go dead for five seconds. Yeah, if you're going to update the profile, that's right. Yeah, so let's say, for instance, here I've got channel A, B, C, D. Uh, actually, it's A, B, C, B. Let's change this to D if I've got a channel D. Um, the only way I can do it from this screen, which is my live pack view, I can't change any of the global settings. However, if I needed to change that for radio pack number four, I can hit edit profile. It'll take me to that profile. And now I can change that to D. And then once again, I hit upload changes and it's going to ask me if I'm sure if I want to do that. And then you'll see it uploads the, the configuration file. I've uh, got a couple more audience questions I'd like to address, if you don't yep. mind. Um, from Dan, can you add the headset connector on the front of the CU into a conference? Yes, you can. And let's I'll show you how to do that. If, you, uh, if I go back to my system diagram, you have to do that from the control unit menu. So I'll double click on that. And we kind of skipped over that, but great question. Um, there is a local headset section of the settings and you would essentially have whatever you have as your list of conferences you can assign any of those to that particular headset you can actually also from the front panel of the control unit you can select which conference you want to talk to as well you can go into a menu and change that so let's say you're sitting in front of the control unit and you need to talk to various conferences you can switch between in the menu okay uh, um uh john christie had a question um about uh the iso functions and conference or talk could this be used to activate a talk key on a bell pack we are actually gpo as opposed to gpio so we don't accept any inputs we do some similar things to that now john uh and the way we handle it and mark will talk about it with the smartphone headsets is our headsets actually have a mute switch in them um and on our our uh microcom line we actually have a physical switch so you can do that externally without having any detrimental issues but those function buttons aren't set up for for that kind of function yeah okay good questions um there is a, a another question here from dan previous times in crewcom i noticed that auto detect mic did not correctly detect my condenser and yes there are we do that by by impedance but there's some mics that don't follow that. So in the menu, you have a choice of automatic or set it directly to dynamic or electric. So that would take care of that problem. And I just did that here. And you'll notice that the little green light came on. Yeah, there's only, you know, the auto detect is kind of based on, you know, average impedances from different microphones, but we definitely see some that, that don't mm -hmm. conform. Um, and from Matt, he asked about the volume press function from Tempest Days. Um, we've had a couple of requests for that. It's a little bit trickier because that button push we are using for ISO, but we'll send that uh, request through to product management. It's a good, good point. What, what is he talking about specific? I'm not familiar with that function. Okay, on the Tempest, um, you could disable the volume control, and the only way you turn the volume was to push and rotate rather than rotate. Gotcha. Back to the question on headset connector in the front of CU. Can the button uh, to activate the talk on that be set to latchable? Yes. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. Oh, I'm not sure it can be. I'm yeah, not sure. For some reason, I thought there was a menu, but no, I, don't I don't think so. If it was yeah. able to go to latchable with the proper adapter, you could use it for another four wire input. Actually, it is. It's latching right now, so must be the oh, default is latch. So it okay, fine. And then you just turn your side tone down all the way. Right. Yeah, it's got off. Yeah, it's huh. it's la it's actually the smart latch. So I press it once, it latches. If I hold oh. it in for two or three seconds, it actually then it'll momentary. But in side tone, you can set that to off, right? It's it's on yes. medium now. Uh, and and one more question from John Christie: Is there a way for Bell Pack users to switch between a list of possible profiles on their own or on the fly? The answer is yes. Um, if you have admin rights, you can either push 
or from the belt pack, you can pull a different profile. So even without a computer, if you preset multiple profiles, you can go ahead and choose the profile that you want without an operator. One of the things that makes the system very easy to use. So you might, for example, have an identical profile, one with latching, one with momentary. So maybe a stage manager likes latching buttons until the show starts. They can change their profile as long as you've already preset it. You can't build right. one that way, but you can get to it. And that's an example of that particular menu where you can choose. So if you had multiple profiles, you can select them all from here, from the pack that, that basically um, go with that particular profile. Um, and Gary mentioned uh, uh, user rights. That's a new 1.8 feature. Um, we do have the ability now to turn on um, either full functionality across both the hardware and the software, or you can set it up to where only administrators can get in and also a password protection. And that's both separate for the hardware and the software. Um, so now you can set up user rights for, uh, for hardware and software. On the belt pack profile selection, that scrolls through all the profiles in the system? All profiles that are built for a four volume pack in this case. Right. It so wouldn't you show you any two volume profiles. And that when you went to that, it would take the the the, the upload time to to switch it over, right? Yeah. Let me. Um, the, by the way, the way you get to the menu is to hold down the triangle button, and then uh, you can use a volume knob to switch to device settings. And then there's one called Pack Profiles, and now it gives me my list of profiles. Let's say I want to select that one. I select it, and it's warning me. Are you sure you want to do that? Well, actually, it's asking me if I want to overwrite my user settings. And let's say no. Let's say I change the mic gain or something. I don't want to, and that's the default. So I hit no, and you get the same uh, update screen. Right? So, so it would go to another profile, but keep all the customized volume settings for you. That's, that's good. right. That's and right. there's four types of profiles, a two volume and a four volume for each of the two frequencies for 900 and for 2.4. You will only see the ones that are available for your pack. That's right. So if you go in and you can't find what you want, you haven't made it. And then the inverse to that is you can do it from crewware uh, or from the front panel of the control unit, actually. And I can up to upload from here as well. And it will change the actual pack. And then it goes back online. Uh, any other questions, Gary? No, I think uh, I th all we've all we've got for right now. I think Mark's been waiting patiently, and I think yeah. uh, Dan Newburn and John Christie get the award for the best questions. Thank you guys. <laughs> and, Matt, and Matt. Okay. All right. Then I will pass it off. Let's see if I can do this without making a mistake. I think I did. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, indeed. We got it. Fantastic. So my name is Mark, and I'm going to talk to you about Lecticon. And by the way, I've got a couple of tough acts to follow here. These two guys did a really great job. So I'm going to get on with it here. We've got a great little tool to keep handy that's affordably priced. It's called the Microcom Series. And these operate in both 900 megahertz and 2.4 gigahertz where legal, and they're also hoppers, just like our CrewCom system. Now, they're a separate system altogether, so you're not gonna be able to use them with a CrewCom system, integrated into a CrewCom system, but you could use it in a reasonable distance away from a CrewCom system to have functionality and to, use, to get up and running on a gig if you wanna do a quick setup. Right now, we're shipping the 900M system, the Microcom 900M, and we will be shipping this summer the new 900XR system from Microcom. And um, they both use the same headsets, which I'll show you later on. But let's get down to some of the details about the 900M that we're currently shipping. It's a nice little small economical single channel system. It's very straightforward, pack to pack operation, hub and spoke, master slave type of approach. You can have up to five full duplex users with an unlimited amount of listen only users, depending upon how you set the user ideas, IDs, and I'll show you that in a moment. And it operates in an 
unlicensed 900 ISM band, and it's a hopper, like I said, 902 to 928. It's encrypted hopping. It has a latch talk button for hands-free operation, and it's got an excellent dynamic range. This was developed for use as an intercom. This wasn't originally something else that's being used in this arena. This is something that was intentionally brought to market to be an intercom system. And as it says down towards the left there in your screen, it's also available at 2.4 gigahertz. It's very small and it's very light. It's weather resistant, has a 10 hour battery life, and you could hook up a USB battery to it and get longer operation times. It will operate while charging from a wall work or from any USB charging system that you could buy anywhere. You don't need to buy ours, although we do offer a very nice little brick that'll charge five of these at a time very quickly for you. But you could run around the corner to Best Buy or one of the other stores and pick up any USB charger, plug into this guy with the uh, provided cable, and you're off to the races. You're charging your belt pack and you're also working while it's charging. And we offer a two-year warranty on these products with registration. It has a one year out of the box. And we'd like you to say hello to us and tell you who you are and what you do. And we'll give you another year on top of it for your troubles. And as I mentioned, it comes with some nice accessories as do all of our devices. We offer a nice amount of cabling, cases, mounts with our radio transceivers and crew com. And in the case of microcom, we give you a nice genuine leatherette case and a, a USB cable, as well as a neck strap for you to hang it around your neck if you don't have any kind of belt to latch it onto. And um, just to give you a little topology view, this also is what you're gonna see in the Microcom XR. We've got an antenna, a nice little LCD screen. There's your volume buttons there to the left. There's a USB charger connection there on the left, which is covered by a cover to keep water and dust out of it. You've got two LEDs at the very top of the unit on the right that tell you what your talk state is, and they tell you where you're charging, and they got a power button, the mode button, which you'll also use for when you're programming the system, and you've got the talk button there with, with the right beneath the big client P logo, and you've got your headset connection, which is terminated to dual mini eighth inch 3.5 millimeter cables and i'm going to show you those headsets shortly and the indicators give you you know everything you need to know what's going on there over to the right here we got a nice little uh up close view of the screen to give you your rssi to give you your volume where it's at if you're talking and what your battery's looking like which gas gauges on your battery um pretty simple to get this thing up and running here you plug in a headset obviously because you're going to need to talk on it and you power it up and you select a group. So obviously you're gonna to wanna to have everybody on the same group. And then those guys that are on that group, you then assign ID numbers to. And four separate groups can operate in the same area. Now those groups will talk to one another, but they will talk to each other within the same group. So one group can't speak to the other, but a group can speak amongst themselves. One belt pack is set to zero, zero, and that's the master. And then all the other belt packs synchronize off of that master unit. Then the subsequent belt packs are set to up to four. Zero, zero to four are your duplex settings. So zero, one through four are the extra guys that are talking to pack zero, zero, user zero, zero. Anybody set up from zero, five above are your listen only packs. So your worker bees can be in listen only if they need to be, and they can be set from zero five to infinity. And then all of your king and queen bees can be set to zero, zero to zero four. And that's assigned through the ID in the menu. And you see that in the screen here on the front of the unit. Now we get to the 900XR, which we'll be shipping later this summer. And this is a dual channel system. So the Microcom 900M was a single channel system. This is a dual channel system. So one channel or the other, not simultaneous. Simple pack-to-back -back operation like the 900M, except with this guy, you get more users. You get 10 full duplex users. 
and an unlimited amount of listen only users, which is what we have also with the 900M. And it operates in the same frequency ISM bands, 900 and 2.4, where legal. It's encrypted at frequency hopping spread spectrum technology. It's in an IP67 rated housing, so it can get wet. It's got a nice display, which gives you a lot more information. Nice OLD display. It also has a field replaceable battery with an extended 15 hour battery life. And there's a drop in charger available for this guy. So you can put your belt packs away at night and come back and it'll be freshly charged the following morning. And it will also charge spare batteries for you. So they're available during the gig. If you start getting low on juice, you can stick another battery in there and get back to work. This screen here will give you an overview of some of the very the differences between the two. And again, the 900M will give you up to five users. The XR will give you 10. Battery life is longer in the XR, but you get a nice 10 hours of battery life out of the 900M. Uh, the 900M has a built-in lithium polymer battery where the XR is field replaceable. Uh, the clip on the 900M is integrated into the genuine leather red holster where with the XR, it's on the belt pack itself. The displays are different. IP rating of 67 on the XR, where you, you just have a moisture resistant unit in the 900M. Both of them take the chargers from USB micros and the drop in chargers only available for the XR. XR is a little bit bigger and weighs a little bit more, but well worth the investment of the weight and size. And right here, we've got a nice array of specialty headsets that are available for the Microcom series. My favorite is the one all the way over to the left, the IEL. It kind of reminds me of the old jobber I had back in the day for my cell phone, but a very nice boom microphone that is very discreet and can fit into your ear and works very nicely, very loud, good to work with, a functional headset. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, I was just going to say as you as you move over, our apologies about the graphic on the PHS LAV. Um, you can kind of see a little gray smudge off to the left. That's actually a clear tube earpiece. And unfortunately, there you go, Art's holding it up. Unfortunately, the graphic isn't too good. So I just want to make sure you got a good shot of that. Thanks, Gary. Sorry about that, folks. That is, um, we had a white background and we got a clear tube there. That's much like the newscaster type of uh, earpiece that they use online for their IEMs. And this is also a lavalier microphone into a clear tube headset. So you can have an even more discreet microphone set up there. And these are also available in push to talk units. So although both belt packs are latched talk buttons, we have a push to talk button that allows you to be offline and then push that button to talk. Go ahead, Gary. Can't hear you, pal. Don't worry. Uh, one other thing, all of these headsets um, are electret, and that is required. All the microcom system units do require electret headset with them as opposed to the, the crewcom, which you have your choice of electret or dynamic. Which is true. And then on top of it, we offer for the microcom our smart boom headsets terminated into a dual three millimeter. And when I get to these headsets, I also want to point out, we just recently sent out a bulletin about sanitizing our headsets and about what's good to use that's not going to destroy them while you're using them during these times. And, um, you know, we're all going to be a little more concerned about health and about sanitation and washing our hands. And, you know, if we do have to share headsets for some reason, there is a way to sanitize them, and we just put a bulletin out that I believe Kelly's going to make available to everybody after our presentation. So our headsets have replaceable cushions and replaceable windscreens, so you can get some extra ones of those if you want to keep them on hand to keep them clean. The windscreens can be washed out with soap and water if you want to freshen them up every so often. And all three of these pliant smart boom headsets are available with multiple different terminations, dual mini three millimeter, 
four pin female XLR, which is what goes into our crew comp systems and other manufacturer systems. And then of course, five pin male XLR. And we offer them in unterminated versions also. Yes, Mr. Gary. Um, Pete actually has a question about the connections. Do we have a microcom adapter to XLR four and five pin from the microcom? And the answer is we don't. There will be an adapter that will give you a four wire style, four wire style IO in addition to the headset, but we don't have any specific adapter to get you from the dual mini to the XLR. Um, quite frankly, if you bought a Electret smart boom, you could wire up your own. Uh, there are the dual mini jack actually is repeated on there. So you could use a single three and a half millimeter mini. And also to that point, Pete, if you were to purchase the larger formats, the SB110 and the SB210, those have field removable cables. So you could purchase a dual mini eighth inch cable also with the electric headset. And you could change those on your own as you're going to from gig to gig using different systems. Why is it a dual jack? Because obviously one of them does everything you need. Yeah, that's a great question. Reason that that was done was to keep the headset jack from rotating inside of the belt pack under professional ap applications. We're figuring these headsets are gonna be used in some pretty rigorous conditions and we wanted to make sure that the, everything was stabilized. So what if I plugged in an adapter that's just made for like one, like for a normal three and a half millimeter uh, iPhone? You could do that. Uh, it may or may not work depending upon the- Mike, go, go back one slide. There. Yeah, right there. Oh, okay. Now you'll notice the two on the left actually are single jacks. Single, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Can I those, plug in two to one belt pack. I don't think so because uh, I think you have a problem because they're both electric mics. So I don't know if there's if there'll be a conflict there. But the the reason for the double jack was simply stability. Just a better but build. Both, both jacks are wired in parallel. Correct. Yes. And if you want to get clever, you could be earbud off of one and a microphone off of another if you want to wire it up and, and go and experiment. So back to the, um, the large format headsets and the uh, professional headsets that we offer. Um, all of these have smart boom capabilities on them. So when you move the boom microphone up to the 12 o'clock position, it'll actually switch off. And these are also ambidextrous, so they go either right ear or left ear dominant, and whichever way is more comfortable for the user. And it's a very flexible gooseneck, so when it's up here, it's off, and when it's down, it's on. And that operates for the dual and a single large format, as well as our nice lightweight, which we have in stock right now and is ready to ship and is becoming very popular and sought after these days. And then last but not least, in um, some of our nice accessories, yes, Gary. Yeah, sorry, one more question from Dan Newburn. Um, are these connectors the same that are used on my CP200? Can I use my existing radio gear? Okay, so, um, I guess Pete answered back, uh, they're four conductor and CP is three conductor. Um, you can, it's a, it is a common ground between the headset um, and, and the, between the earpiece and the mic. Uh, so they are, uh, you know, they are uh, uh, potentially, uh, you could do an adapter if it didn't work directly. And the, the two mini jacks are wired in parallel. Okay, you're back, Mark. Great, thank you. And then last but not least, we want to talk about our um, Pete's favorite little stocking stuffer, the uh, Flex OR that we are shipping now. We have two flavors of this, a FLX 45 and an FLX 44, and it's basically taking a female four five pin and converting it to a female four pin, or taking a male four pin and converting it to a female Four pin. I think I got that right. And um, these are nice, handy little tools that have ha available. 
and they're very low profile. One end goes into your belt pack of choice and it'll lock in there so it doesn't come out when you remove your headset for some reason. You need to use a little greenie to get it out. And then um, you plug your headset in there and you're only adding about a half of an inch onto your profile there. So it's you don't have to have a one foot long adapter cable made to adapt your headset to somebody else's system. And that I believe is that. And I'm gonna hand it off now. I think I did stop viewing my screen. Okay. Is your dark back on? Okay. Um, and we, I, I'm not seeing any other questions coming up from the audience unless you said something, Pete. Yeah, Henry Cohen does point out that two pin connectors uh, uh, from Motorola are totally different wired, so they're not compatible. Um, I have, uh, where do I have it? <clears throat> over here. You know, one of the things I know you had a session on, you know, operating in, in, in the COVID environment and where we're moving forward. And we put out a a, uh, a bull in this morning, which you, you guys will post. Um, but one of the really nice things is using that little five pin to four pin adapter, uh, having the ability to use that um, with a five pin headset and somebody who wants their own headset between those two devices, they can go virtually any place and plug into almost anything with their own gear. So you can either go with something really little that you could throw 20 of in your pocket, or you can go back to the olden days of this big old heavy adapter hanging out the bottom of your belt pack. Uh, the, uh, the, the actual device has a latch on one end, but there's a little pin on the other end. So when I plug it into this, uh, garden variety belt pack. Uh, it, now I can't get to the latch, so this is just a latch for a, a male plugged in. So I need to use a a, uh, a a greenie or something just to put it in that hole, push in, and pop it out. It's a really great solution to an old problem. And right now it's only female to female, five to four, uh, but maybe they'll make some uh, male to males too. Yeah, you know, we, we looked at it. Um, this, uh, to be frank with you, is a shockingly expensive uh, thing to build. And so we looked well, at where we felt the need was. I bought this for $125. I didn't think it was very bad at all. I thought that was a good price. <laughs> the actual price is actually $39.95. And, um, which, which is about the same price as this, from a from a manufacturer who makes them, I know well, I can make this for twelve bucks. But you know that that little adapter that you've got in your hand with the green cable has another advantage to it, though, because every five or six times you use it, it breaks. You have to take it apart, so it results in some job security for your tax. Uh, that's not built into these. <laughs> no, unfortunately, that's going to probably no, last. No user repair repairable parts inside. Uh, no user serviceable parts. Oh, built-in well. job insecurity we can yeah. always help we can always help <laughs> absolutely we got any more questions there pete while we're looking i'll let you know that i did upload that document gary to the handout section right. we'll of course include that on our website and on um, on our video links uh, so people can get to that but that's a great document nice and and uh very clear yes both yeah. from a maintenance standpoint, as well as uh, I like that you included the part numbers for, for the microphone windscreens and the headphone uh, covers and quantities, things like that. Really straightforward and easy. Um, it's just that easy. It's just, honestly, that's great. You know, um, it really is the philosophy of the company, Kelly. We really, from turn it on, here's your volume control, here's your belt pack, go to work, mm -hmm. to you, giving you what you need. We really try to, put ourselves in the customer seat. Well, this is uh, this is clearly a product that uh, is something that, that you have thought about um, over and over, every feature. Um, uh, we love it when we hear that's coming in the next one. 
we don't consider that to be a bad thing when a manufacturer says, yep, that's that's the feature that's coming or that's a feature we're thinking about because uh, there is no product that's gonna have everything from day one. Sorry, that's just the way it works because um, Pete's always coming up with new ways to break the system. So you you may think you figured something out from day one, but no, I promise you, um, Pete will come up with something. But uh, well, thanks again. A, the, the, even the one that's available right now is a perfect package for a, a camera shoot crew. You know, your cameraman, assistant cameraman, your dolly grip, et cetera, plus all the rest of the crew can be on listen-only bell packs. Right. Yeah, and the, the ability for these guys to work together, the, you know, having a group of five lighting guys and a group of five audio guys and a group of five uh, um, camera guys all working in the same place at the same time, it's kind of unusual. And one of the nice things, not just the crew comm, but these systems also sound good. And I don't mean just fidelity. They have high dynamic range, which means when you're in a noisy environment, they still work just fine. And that's a that's a problem with a lot of systems. Now, not to throw water on the fire, but do they work at the same time with your crewcom system in the well, same and, RF space? You know what? They're not synchronized together. So now you're going to get into the laws of RF. You're going to be in the same area. Um, and what does happen because they are hopping is, you know, if you've got some distance on it, like I said, with the Shure mic, you know, 50 feet away, it was fine. Closer, it wasn't. You know, if you've got some proximity to the transceivers, you're probably fine. But if right. not, you may get occasional garbling or something like that. It's not the old days of static pops and going yeah. offline and that kind of stuff. It really just translates into intelligibility. And they're like uh, like Crewcom impervious to 2.4 Wi-Fi, correct? Well, when you say impervious, everything can affect everything. But well, you're able in to general and generally all these frequency hopping devices everybody's has such a high peak level rf in the hops that is maybe 10 times the level of the wi-fi noise floor as a noise floor they right. all were at the worst case it's going to degrade the wi-fi well and and the noise floor is the key factor here on all of these systems it's the single biggest thing that people forget about it almost doesn't even matter what frequency because you've yeah. got so much yeah. intermodulation that everybody's uh, everybody's harmonizing with everybody else and you almost have broadband noise uh but it's being close enough to the source to get over it right get the transceiver it's not the old days where you just cranked up the power you can't crank up the power you don't want asymmetrical coverage now put the transceiver where the people are right and you'll be fine right um go ahead pete Dave wanted to know if you could use a static bell pack and wire an adapter to allow an interface via a small mixer from a four wire. You do have a four wire adapter coming. Yes. And and yes, that should be fine. Yeah. A lot of people asking about it. And then I had a thought, uh, could you make the push to talk button operatable by a Bluetooth push to talk that so you can stick on your camera arm or on your whatever, that it just operates the bell pack via Bluetooth? Well, it's possible, but there's a couple of things about that. Number one, you know, people say, why can't you just have Bluetooth in your ear to the pack? And I always ask the question, well, how's your Bluetooth work? And they go pretty good. I said, well, it's pretty good enough for preference. Well, I'm talking about push to talk mode, push to talk, push well, to talk then, action, not I, audio. No, no, I understand, but even then, Bluetooth is not the best connection, so you may push the talk and not get the result you want. Secondly, Bluetooth is still in 2.4, so if you had a 900 system, I would say, sure, I'd, I would probably be okay if you're if you're close range. 2.4 system, I'd have to test it. Maybe then a Zigbee button, which can operate outside the 2.4 band by a few megahertz. Maybe, maybe. Like we said, no matter what you do, yeah. Pete will always find something. <laughs> all right. So, which is which is great. That's why I love you, Pete. You know that. That's. Uh, I always uh, I always see the possibility. A couple you, more questions have come in. Yeah, we got we got uh, one or two more there that came in. Uh, feel free to address those if you'd like. Sure, Stephen. Any thoughts on making the talk button into a smart button, or you'll be sticking to either momentary or latching? 
Okay, so I assume this is on the XR. The XR is always a latching system, and then we use the headset switch or the push to talk option for the head for the uh, um, unique options for a headset to to interrupt if necessary. But it is a latching only system. Do you give the XR the option to use the same hopping schemes as Crewcom? That way, you could give up some of your Crewcom hopping schemes to the micro. Um, we could, we can't. It is a very different radio system. But even if we could do that, you would still need a way to synchronize the radios because even if you use the same compatible style hopping system, you'd have to have a way to keep them from phasing. So unfortunately, unfortunately not. Well, well you can have to start working on that. We want to have a sync cable to Crewcom from your wireless, from your wireless from, sync. from your. Uh, um, from your microcom that's this big, you want to get a nice, nice. Isn't there a sync signal built into this? <laughs> <laughs> if you say so, Pete, yes. I, I, I think we're just going to put all this into the mileage will vary um, category. Um, a lot of these discussions are, are around, you know, uh, as we discovered on all of our RF discussions, we have, you know, the ability to manage our our frequencies but equally we're we're probably going to be more around rf coordinators and rf managers where we're using the laws of physics in our favor spacing things you guys talked about that are just um uh when you need a solution that's the idea that there are a lot of solutions out here no one thing is perfect for every single application that's why we have a lot of different options so um you know uh do I dare say, Pete, do you have any more? Or I do. I do. You do. Uh, uh, Stephen Burnside expanded on his question. Uh, his question about smart buttons was about Crewcom, not about Microcom. So there we use the same headset switch and we interrupt that. And while we don't manufacture anything externally, it could be done. It's just an interrupt. But uh, he's talking about push and hold for momentary and tap for latch. Well, that is the way the latching button works. So, so the latching is, button will be momentary. If you in match, you push it down and let go, it's only momentary. Right. If, if the latching button, you push and release, it's latching. You right. push and continue to talk for three seconds and release, it's momentary. So that is that is smart. That's what he yeah. meant. So it does have that. Got it. And there you go. If only I could be as smart as the buttons around me. Exactly. Um, I've been pushing you for a long time, Kelly. You've been, you've been pushing every one of my buttons, Pete, for many years. <laughs> They're probably well, latching, not momentary. That's right. Right. It's all momentary. <laughs> Kelly, one, more point, one more point to consider. Um, the fellow, uh, uh, Lauren Sherman, who acted as frequency coordinator for the Super Bowl, um, took it under his wing to include all frequencies. A lot of times the guys are just dealing, it's old school UHF stuff and oh yeah, we don't do the 900, that does what it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really recommend that it's not coordinating the RF, but it is managing it and out, out of the UHF band. And I do recommend that, you know, when you're doing shows, take take the whole spectrum into account and, and just keep an eye on it. And um, that's also a great way to have a voice in the discussion with with manufacturers like yourself uh, when we're willing to embrace things that may not work exactly like devices that we've had in the past or may start changing that paradigm i think the more we embrace that the greater voice we can have um and uh like you you have shown you are willing to come back with and here's a couple ideas and here's a couple ideas so you know we'll 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 keep that list going and uh, I'm sure this will not be the last time that we interact um, before uh, we're officially past this moment in time. Meanwhile, thank you so much, everybody, for, for coming, yeah, being a part of this. So Folks that were listening, thanks for uh, being on. Uh, keep an eye on the website. We're going to have you know continued updates around all these things. And, uh, and remember, the, the CrewCon software is free, available to you to play with right now. If you have nothing to do in your spare time during the COVID crisis, download it and play with it. There It'll you go. Buy hours and be fun for kids and family. And if you have <laughs> questions, contact us. We're happy yep. to help you.
You have no excuse, folks. No excuse. So on that note, so long. Everybody go enjoy your afternoon. And uh, for those of you coming back to join us uh, at 4 Eastern, uh, we'll uh, we'll be back here doing our thing with uh, Backbone PL. Terrific. Audio over internet. All Thank right. You. So long, guys. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.